This week on the Markcast, the USFL has announced team names, and apparently that's what we're talking about big time. It was a big debate on the show. Do we lead with CFL or do we lead with USFL? We have it all. It's all time coded. We have all the interviews. We have everybody else. But yes, we're talking USFL team names. And then we're also talking CFL semifinals with a loaded slate of guests. Davis Sanchez. So who are you taking between that, between uh, Saskatchewan and Calgary? I'm not giving you picks in the beginning of the week. This is not the way it works. Well, this isn't going to air till Friday, so you're safe. Uh, okay, you can keep it under wraps. I'll keep, no, it, I'll keep Davis. Yeah, I'll keep your your pick. Gonna, yeah, we're not going to blow up the internet with my pick here. Yeah. Uh, um, Morally, Scott, you know, with Edmonton Elks, we're talking all about the nuclear breakdown of that franchise. They just couldn't get on the same page. I don't even know if they're in the same book at sometimes, right? In the time I've been I've been broadcasting Elks games, which is 11 years now, I've never seen this kind of disconnect with a team and. and it shouldn't have been that way, considering they had to spend so much time together. Definitely an uh, interview I'm looking forward to listening to. Also, Luke Melinder from the Rough Riders and CKRM. You've got to understand the nature of, of, of the beast. Every single time you're out there on the field, you're, you're, you're interviewing for a job. Last week, instead of understanding the job opportunity, right, and the job interview that you're always in, in professional football, every single rep is an, is, is an interview. I felt like that wasn't that could have been focused on a lot more. Yeah, so we've got you all set up. We're previewing all of the CFL matchups. We're talking USFL. We're making fun of the merch. We're ranking the logos. We're picking our teams. Lots of fun games this week. Lots of stuff going on. Of course, we got to talk about a little, little bit of XFL news. We're going to talk about PJ Walker. We're going to talk about Ka- Taylor Heinrich. We're talking about Cam Newton as well. Look at a rock in the jersey. And uh, yeah, also uh, some potential uh, legal situations regarding, you know, Oakland moving to the, the athletics moving to Vegas, St. Louis in their NFL lawsuit continuing. It's all this week on the Markcast. Hopefully you guys had a happy Thanksgiving. It's Friday. It's time for the Markcast. Welcome to the show. It's a happy American Thanksgiving. I already, I, when I posted the teaser on Facebook, I was, I put the American flag and I got a lot of, it's, you know, it's not Canadian Thanksgiving. I said, no, that's why. We're put, Americans. That's why I put, also Facebook was created in, in America by Mark Zuckerberg. So no, I'm just kidding. But no, happy American Thanksgiving. Uh, hopefully, yeah, we had, we, so we're going to get, so we have a ton of USFL news and all that. And then the CFL, yeah, really easy to get CFL people this week because of obviously the Canadian, you know, but, uh, I have my my hooks out for some good uh, USFL guests uh, coming, you know, in, in the coming weeks after that. But we have all the info today. But just in terms of interesting people to talk to, so cool. Davis Sanchez, former CFL Stampeder and uh, Edmonton, Montreal, and BC player. He also won three Grey Cups. He's joining the show. Morley Scott, Edmonton Elks play by play announcer on six thirty CHED. Probably coming on to talk about all the craziness happening in Edmonton right now. And Luke Melinder, CFL analyst for six twenty CKR. CKRM and the Rough Riders also joining Reed uh, this fine afternoon. Yeah, Davis, you know, he's with the TSN. He's with the Milt Steagles of the world. He's good. Morally, Scott, yeah, we were like, well, we'll just get you on the show. And then it ended up that Edmonton blew their world up this week. So that was good. And then Luke's great. Luke is a really um, passionate, really great interview. I mean, I know people listen to Luke all the time on on the air, right? Um, Doing the uh, uh, analysis. I can't talk with my braces, but uh, really uh, passionate, you know, talking about Rough Riders kind of heading into their playoff uh, games this weekend. Can I ask a question? And uh, I might be getting completely off track here. We're going to lead with USFL this week, yeah. and I don't think we should be, but that's that's neither here nor there. Okay. I think we should be talking about CFL playoff football, but that's just me. I, I, I agree. It, well, I don't I disagree because I made the show. Really? Uh, they, well, but they announced all the teams this week. They announced the teams. They announced the logos. They announced a lot of things that way. I feel like interest is high right now for USFL. Okay. I, I respectfully disagree. I think we should be talking about CFL playoffs, but that's what we're going to start off with. We're going to especially talk about this, this merch, 
this merch the US, USFL is putting out. Well, a couple of things. Yeah. So we have our uh, uh, preface here. So we have our XFL guessing game. I thought this was really fun. I put together. So before we get done, so we all know the XFL store is coming back in 2022 with the new teams and all that stuff. So if you go to my Twitter, I have a questionnaire that you can fill out, kind of like pick your spot on the calendar. And if you pick when they went, you know, when the store comes live, I'm going to send you a piece of merch from the store. I thought we have like 25 people have already filled out ball. Good. You have, to be, you have to be subscribed to us. You have to be following us on Twitter. But I thought that was really fun. And then uh, speakpipe.com slash voicemails. Uh, Jenna has a voicemail, a really nice one that we're going to listen to today. Uh, Richard O for Real just got one in, like, literally as we logged on here. So, Richard, we'll see if we get to yours or not. We'll see how we do time-wise. You know what would be kind of cool, to, too, is to use that speakpipe, that answering machine, basically, to if you have questions yes. for a guest or for us, please leave a message. Yeah, I always post the guests, you know, a couple of days before when we kind of have everything lined up. And yes, I, I, I try to encourage that on Twitter. But yes, uh, if you ever have any questions for guests, I'll play it. I mean, I can play it right for the guests. They can hear your voice. We can do it on the show. Uh, but yes, so moving into this USFL stuff. I will tell you, uh, the, you know, whatever concerns you want to have about the USFL, this merch situation is the most alarming thing about this league so far with a bullet. Yeah. Like, I'm serious because these hats have come out. I'm going to put this stuff up here on the YouTube. I have everything screenshotted. So these hats that came out, they have $60 long sleeve fitted crew shirts. The hats are 25 But this is, as Paul knows, very much so because I did a lot of pain in the butt printful when we were trying to get all of our merch like this is reminiscent of like you and i sitting there trying to figure out like well what looks good on this one like let's add it to the store okay let's get a different stock image okay let's get i mean this is like scary time yep and holy cow like even the fact that they have like okay it's the printful models right i mean this are these are like the stock images but we have some that are like the normal image we have some that are like you know the the different gentlemen right there's different like it doesn't as bad as the xfl shop was at times and not having like they never always had like all the authentic jerseys and all the right sections or whatever it was never quite right this is terrifying to me that we have this amount of money going into this and like this is what we've come out with in the last three days. You, you, like, I don't think that if you are a league with that many resources behind you, you shouldn't be using drop shipping to sell merchandise. That's, that's another thing. Like you should, you should have some kind of DTG uh, person that's buying these things in bulk and you're not buying these per cost. That's what's driving the cost of like that $60 for a long sleeve fitted crew. That's insanity to me. And that would go down if you guys, if the group would like approach an actual uh, garment vendor and get these things bought, bought in bulk, so they can bring the cost down for everybody else that wants to actually buy one of these. I don't know who would want to buy that uh, all over print beanie by the generals, but it looks like a luchador mask. They're really bad. And, and, and this is, and I'm not trying to, but like, I, we have USFL people that like follow us on Twitter now, right? Like, hopefully, you know, presumably might listen to the, at least the intro of this show. This is scary. This is like end of world situation stuff. And we're like, we're getting ready to launch this league. And yes, we're using like WooCommerce and Printful to do this. And it's someone sitting there dragging logos onto these pre designed templates and trying to print these hats. It's very, very scary. Speaking of hats, I brought out my XFL. Black Friday hat today, in case you didn't miss that one. Uh, but it was a year ago today. We got our famous, infamous uh, XFL Black Friday hat. So, yeah, cool. All right, so let's move on. Let's get the show going. Let's start with the USFL TSL stuff. Um, the names and uh, logos were released this week on the Cowherd Show. Yeah, do, do you? Are you a Colin Cowherd fan? I am not. No, and, uh, it, and, and it's just like. His takes are just some kind, sometimes so asinine. Like one year, he was talking about how like Utah State was going to upset Arizona in, in the basketball tournament, and then when Utah State didn't win, he's like, "I'm taking Arizona to win, go all the way." And it's like, bro, you just said they were out last like two days ago. Now, now all of a sudden they're going to go all the way. They would have if Illinois hadn't cheated them, but that's another story for another day. So, um, yeah. Yeah, this this to me, obviously, it's great, right? Fox property, Fox owns, you know, USFL. They're using, you know, Colin's show on FS1. Uh, that was great, right? I like the synergy of that, doing that. Uh, the one problem that we I encountered online that Mark Perry brought up is like, 
you're not going to have a lot of NBC and CBS coverage for a Fox owned property, right? Which is just something to keep in mind, right? Like what you get from FS1 or Fox, you're going to lose in that. But like, it was such like an afterthought in the three hour show. It was buried like at 1045. The show runs, you know, like nine to noon. No presence from the USFL, like right, Brian Johnston, someone could have been on there, Brian Woods, someone talking about this stuff. It was just kind of presented matter of factly, right? And I just didn't like that. Even with the, and I hate being the homer, but even with the, the XFL, um, Doing that live stream, having the little pre-produced videos, right? Like, we're the dragons coming from the sea. You remember that? And they were like, we're the Dallas Renegades. Like, And it was like just stock foot. I mean, it wasn't like that Spielberg, whatever. But just like presenting them on the board like Colin did and being like, these are the teams. I think spring football is a, is a good idea. It felt a little flat to me. I did not see the announcement, but I, you know, I did see like part bits and pieces of it where Colin was just talking by himself. There was nobody else to kind of help him. And I completely agree with your assessment that they should have had someone on here to help them. And back to this merch thing, like the more that I think about this merch thing and I'm like, why are they using drop shippers and, and printful and stuff? I just, I get a bad feeling. I get a really bad feeling. Yeah. So we have the teams. I have some notes down below here, but your teams, you know, your North division, Michigan Panthers, New Jersey generals, Philadelphia stars and the Maulers. We have the Birmingham Stallions, Houston Gamblers, New Orleans Breakers, and Tampa Bay Bandits. Uh, we, we have a, a soundbite I've pulled up here in a minute with Brian Johnson, who's kind of like the exec VP, talking about why they picked some of the cities and stuff. I'll be really curious to get your thoughts about that, Paul. But looking at these logos, and I'm going to put them on just as we talk about them for a minute, do any of these strike you, you know, Michigan Panthers? It, it's a lot of reds, and um, I don't know, it feels like a lot of these logos feel very similar yeah. to each other. There's a lot of reds. I mean, the breakers is the only one that like deviates from any kind of red in their logo. Wow. Yeah. You know, so yeah, Michigan Panthers, uh, a lot of these have lineages, right? Like to the previous USFL. So down here, you know, Mike Mitchell was talking about, um, the, uh, the initial USFL champions, you know, were the Panthers, the NFL has the Panthers so the USFL could have done better. Why not the Memphis showboats bringing out some of these other names, right? You know, Birmingham stallions. That was a you know popular one from back in the day. Everybody knows the New Jersey, New Jersey generals when it comes to Trump, but you know, like the bandits is kind of neat. Again, I, the Tampa Bay thing is weird to me, except obviously you have the, the old USFL ties. Yeah, that's about it. Do you think it's odd that there is a Pittsburgh team and a Philadelphia team? No. They're I mean, so close to each other. Well, I mean, the stars are closer to the generals technically than, than the Pittsburgh team. Okay. Well, so, but I mean, they're all, so I have a map. I'm going to put it in a minute. We have the quote. We do have a quote from Brian Woods. I would have loved to have seen, like I said, have Brian on Colin's show. He says, we're excited to take the next major step in development of the new USFL, uh, USFL president of football operations, Brian Woods. These eight teams form the core of our initial league membership and will represent an exciting brand of professional football coming in the spring. We look forward to the start of our inaugural season. I just, <clears throat> I don't know. I, I, you know, there's, there's no West coast teams. There's no, you know, there's no West coast teams, none, no Vegas. Like, well, I, the, the Oakland thing is weird to me. Cause I, if I remember right, Oakland was a big part of like the initial USFL, right? Right. But I, I, I don't think it really even matters. Cause I mean, they're all playing in like a hub. So like the, the city names are a formality for me. Well, and I got a lot of feedback about that, but I said, but the, the plan is in year two and three, right? We're moving these out. So I'll put the map up here. I'll remember. So, you know, I, I kind of, cause I like to visualize this. So, so just, you know, cause you hear like, okay, where's Detroit again? Okay. Where's whatever, you know, obviously they're clustered over there. I get that. Right. I get that for the bubble. I get that for travel, but then in terms of like TV viewership, I mean, I guess you're going to have everything be East coast time. You're not going to have to worry about that, but it is weird to me that Houston is as far West as we go. Yeah, I mean, like I said, Vegas would have been a great one. Oakland, there's so many other USFL franchises that maybe you kind of like drug up, you know, like like the Memphis Showboats. That would be a great one too, but it's just like, it's just, it's very just Southern and Northeastern and there's not much of the map covered other than two strips. That's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at two strips. And and we'll play this zero, uh, clip here in a minute, but it's, you know, I, I get, right? I get it, it's easier for that season one, but I... 
if, if you're in a bubble anyway, you can call them whatever cities you want. You can call them the Seattle. They can still play in Birmingham. And then when you're moving uh, teams, I just don't know how you're going to entice any West Coast viewing audience, except obviously people interested in spring football uh, coming into this. If you look, I also have the XFL map here. You kind of see where they're at, you know, presuming this is why we talk about the XFL, USFL Civil War, right? The title of the episode, you know, them coming back to Tampa, can Tampa support you know, like the bandits and the Vipers and can't the even support the race. They can't even support the race. So how can they support the Vipers and the bandits? Well, you know, and like the question here, like new Orleans, I don't know where they like, because I, when I posted online, I got a lot of like, well, these city, th- this map doesn't matter right now. Cause they're all playing in the bubble. I go, yes. But when they're moving out in year two and three, it will matter. Cause unless you're going to change and then it's going to be the, Oakland Maulers, it matters, right? What the cities are called. Like, where would they even play in New Orleans? I mean, the Saints play down, you know, in the dome. They're not going to play in uh, Caesars. It's not Mercedes Benz, or it's the Caesars. Like, they're not going to play in the dome. You don't think? Is the USFL in year two going to play in the dome? I mean, that's just like a 70,000 person. I don't think they should, but I mean, where else are they going to play? Well, exactly. They could play at LSU's field. They could play at like, uh, you know, they could play different places. You go to LSU. Yeah. I mean, my, Mike Mitchell reported, you know, that like some of these cities have been named, right, presumably because they have some idea of interest or whatever. But why this matters is these are going to be the cities moving forward. You're not going to change the name in year two. I'm going to play this clip with Daryl Johnson. I think that this is going to be insightful too. It's a little bit of a long one, but this is. Um, it's basically like an 11 minute soundbite cut down to three minutes, but I do think that you'll have some interest here. Um, in this fall, the first question preceding the answers from the guest or from the host is uh, why isn't San Antonio included kind of in this initial rollout? And then he's going to talk about them moving forward from there. This is Daryl Johnson, uh, Johnston, executive vice president of uh, USFL. The San Antonio Gunslingers are, are one of the, the teams from the USFL. Um, you know, we're, we're hoping we're hoping to have success this time uh, and be able to push this into season two, season three. And hopefully, as that starts to happen, we can we can bring back some of the other franchises that were a part of the USFL. Uh, and, and San Antonio, because of the response and that the we had with the the commanders down there, I mean, they have been the envy of, of the XFL. Um, yeah, even the talk with the NFL now, and I can't imagine as we move out to the West, if you kind of look at, at how the structure of that league is going to be right now, it's it's four Northern and four Southern. You know, we really have it. We've got Houston. And we've got New Orleans. So, you know, San Antonio can be a fit. Uh, the big thing will be the geography of the team. So as we start to, to slide, you know, I'm, I'm going to be pushing for San Antonio. Seems like with the Alliance, with the XFL, which you were also a part of, it seemed like the teams that did the best with corporate sponsors, uh, ticket sales, and, and merchandise were football-hungry cities that also – did not have an NFL team in them. And when I look at the NFL cities that of the original late here for the rebirth of the USFL, you're in a lot of NFL cities. I thought that maybe the new spring leagues would try to avoid that. You know, when, when Fox purchased the rights to the USFL, they, they got everything. They got, you know, the cities, the colors, the logos, the, the, the mascots. So it, it was best for them to stay, you know, true to what the original vision was. Um, and, and we've gotten a lot of positive feedback and people are excited for the fact that, you know, you, you're going to get to see the Tampa Bay Bandits and the Houston Gamblers and, you know, the teams that they remember, uh, you know, on the first go around with the USFL. So there's more to this. But what do you think about that? That basically like, well, we bought these properties like this is what people remember. This is where we're going back. Like, is that a, that to me does not make sense in 2021, 2022, like base the cities that you want to play around. It doesn't. And I mean, like if we're being honest, like New Orleans didn't end up in New Orleans at the very end of this, they ended up in Portland. Yeah. Portland breakers. I mean, you know, and you have other teams like the express and the Denver gold, like these teams that, you know, weren't considered to be added because I don't know too far West, I guess. I don't know, but you the idea fixed, you could have fixed it. You could have fixed it. I mean, if you could put Houston and San Antonio, LA and Portland in one or even Portland, Denver, LA and San Antonio in one, thing, then you, you fixed your problem where you have this whole big swath of geography you're not taking control of. 
It just seems weird to me that like, well, these were the cities back in 83. So these are the cities we're going for in 2022. Like that just seems that is a long disconnect. It's the same thing with like the CFL where they're like, well, the 90s expansion didn't work. It's like, well, okay. Yeah. But it was also like 40 years ago. I mean, it's just, or there, whatever, 30 years ago. I mean, it's just a long, just to base TV markets and things off of decisions that were made back in the 80s. just seems very odd to me. And I mean, the Houston Gamblers ceased to be a, a team after they were going to merge with the generals. Like this just like, there's some, there's some other teams that would have great, uh, you know, support in the cities that they picked. If they picked like, you know, St. Louis for a franchise, even though St. Louis didn't have a franchise, the first go around, you could have put the bulls there. You could have put, you could have put the showboats there. You could have put the Panthers there. You could have done anything to get, St. Louis a team and, and, you know, increase your, increase your profile. I think they, they've, they've missed a big, big opportunity to kind of, you know, if, 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 if we're talking about a USFL, USFL, XFL thing, a back and forth between these two leagues, the USFL had a chance to jump on markets that the XFL kind of owns right now. Cause F, XFL owns the St. Louis market. They do. And you had a chance to put a team in a market, but not in a market since they're playing in a bubble in a market mm-hmm. that needs a team and you could have helped kind of push the XFL's ownership of St. Louis out, but you, you, you dropped the ball on that. Drop the ball on that. Yeah. I, here's the second part of this clip. This is talking about the time of year they're going to play. And I thought this was interesting as well in terms of working with the NFL. You know, there is a little bit of that there, but that does force you into Philadelphia, into Pittsburgh. You know, the, the Michigan team will play probably out of Detroit. So probably to your point, yeah, we, we are in a lot of cities <laughs> I mean, uh, that have that carry on. I, I think the way that we have everything structured so far this time, you know, going to one host city and, and, and minimizing the expenses coming out there in year one and, and really concentrating and focusing on the product of the, of the quality of football and the quality of the football players. And then once we leave, you know, that, that host city and, and the teams go back, you know, that'll give them a year you know, over a year to kind of build the excitement for those teams to arrive into the host cities. We're not the, the traditional calendars that were used the last two years, you know, that weekend after the Super Bowl, we're actually going to push it back. We've run some analytics and, and we we think we found a better window that gives us a little bit more time, you know, to get this up and running. So, uh, you know, that, that'll be helpful. Uh, number one, to, to make sure that we get this done the right way. Um, you know, organizing everything and launching it. But number two, I, I think the other important thing is is just, as you pointed out, moving forward, you know, into year two, there's this window that we've selected that we feel is a real downtime in sports and making the calendar friendly. So if, if guys do catch some NFL eyes, there's time for them to get into a, into an NFL camp. It'll be a little bit tighter fit than it was for the Alliance or the XFL, but it'll still provide them the time, you know, to get into an NFL camp. There you go. What's, what's, I will say, what's odd to me, you know, the big thing with the XFL, again, hate being the homer, having the team presidents, having the local people there working with the communities, doing the giveaways, doing the signs, doing the events, doing the things that they did. That is how you build a local fan base. I don't think, well, they're going to have a year and a half to get excited in, you know, Michigan. Because we're playing, but I, I don't think that that. Don't know where we're playing, but we don't know where we're playing. That was scary, scary to me when he's like, "Well, presumably out of Detroit." That's terrifying to me. Yep. But you're just you're you're assuming that you're going to have ownership and interest there to move that team. That to me, it just seems very backwards to me that they have how they're building that. So, um, I we need to pick our teams. So, who are you picking for your? It, we're right to change if like they come out and they say like the best coach in the world is coaching for someone else. But right now, who is your team? I'll pick the breakers because they don't have red in their logo. Why not? You're going to pick the breakers. Well, and we had good times in new Orleans. You know, we went and saw the, uh, you know, WrestleMania there and that was good. Uh, I am based on a fan vote. It came down to the Michigan Panthers, which I was very terrified about. And then the Houston gamblers, I'm a gambling man. I think we're going to go with the Houston gamblers, even though the G doesn't really look like a G, but, um, you know, we've been to Dallas. We've been to San Antonio. Maybe we can go to Houston here coming up. I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to go. Well, I don't know. That's Houston. 
Uh, real quick, this was just interesting. We don't have to go through all this Mike Mitchell stuff, but the USFL, uh, they, the USFL news on Twitter ranked the, the logos that they had. And based on the fan votes, and he has you know, like quite a following, like 2,000 followers. So uh, Tampa Bay was voted number one, Michigan two. I don't get that Michigan one. Pittsburgh Maulers, I get that. It kind of looks like Thor's Hammer. Birmingham, I think the Stallions just have a lot of nostalgia. Philadelphia Stars, uh, New Jersey Generals, Houston, and then you're New Orleans Breakers. So we are two large two teams at the bottom bottom of the back oh well that's fine i'm not mad about that at all so uh mike mitchell broke down all these different locations um and he has some very you know solid points about weather um in those northeast markets during the spring you know not this year of course but afterward uh it's going to be interesting to see how how attendance plays out february march during the time that they need you know they want to put fans in in the seats those weather in those in like Michigan and in the Pennsylvania and New Jersey area is kind of still really tough to go, uh, un, you know, go through during those months. I mean, they were talking about there was WrestleMania happening in New York in April, and they were talking about how the weather might play a factor, the snow might play a factor in April at a WrestleMania. So, same problem happening here. Yeah. So basically, yeah. I and mean, they basically, uh, Birmingham's the only non NFL. I just think that that's so weird that that was the rationale was, well, sorry, I hit my keyboard. Well, those are the ones that we own before. And so that's what we're going to go back to. I just seems weird. Uh, Mark Perry had this one last tweet and I'm like screaming at Mark already in my head. Uh, Mark Perry, XFL News. Up. The USFL has North and South Division. So the XFL had East and West. Just putting it out there. Merger at some point. Stop it. Stop. <laughs> Stop it. I don't, don't want to hear that word anymore. No, it, we, there's so much right now, just because that all came about with the XFL and the CFL, this is not a mergeable thing right now. We need to stop. We really need to stop with that. Yeah. Let's just table any mentions of mergers for the time being. Mergers and acquisitions. What was it? What was the American cycle? Mergers and murders and uh, executions. <laughs> yeah. You like it? Anyway, toss to break right now. We're going to throw it to break. Give us, uh, get some commercials in. Davis Sanchez, Morley Scott, Luke Melinda coming up after this. We have David Sanchez here. I'm so excited to be talking. We're getting into the semifinals here, uh, working our way through the TSN on, you know, on TV, uh, CFL panel. We had a friend of the show, Milt Stiegel on a few weeks ago. Uh, how are you doing today and how has the season been thus far for you? I don't know if that sounds good. You're running, you're running through this, you're running through the TSN panel. Uh, but, uh, Good. Um, I'm excited. It's playoff time. Uh, that's uh, obviously what we're all waiting for. And uh, I think the best part of it is because of the whole COVID and, you know, being off for a season, the fact that we, we got the season in, I think is, uh, I don't know, it makes, at least it makes me more appreciative of, of this. And it's not going to be, you know, the same Grey Cup as we're used to. Some of the festivities is, is uh you know, some things aren't going to be there, but uh, it's just going to be nice to, to see everybody again or a lot of folks again and, and uh, you know, kind of c- celebrate uh, getting through the season and, and back on the field. So I, I'm excited to see everyone. We haven't been, the panel has been in studio the whole time, so we haven't got a chance to get out to the stadium. So it's, I'm excited. It's, uh, it's a good time of year. And then Christmas right after. So how could, how could, uh, it's going to be a good December. I know it's really, yeah, and I guess we've, uh, it's, I've been told it's getting cold. We've, you know, we've had our listeners tell us, you know, uh, it's this degrees today, you know, bring your jackets and things. We're excited. You know, it, much has been made this season about, you know, the entertainment of the game, right? Some people have said this, this season is, is maybe lacking a little bit. Uh, Bob Young just came out and said this is the best CFL season ever. I think the truth probably exists somewhere in between. Where do you come down on, uh, just the quality of the game and everything this year? Is that a Taylor Heineke jersey? It is. Wow. But is there a connection between you and Taylor? Uh, he's a former XFL player now, and my wow. team is Washington football team, and so we okay. and we have beaten Tom Brady now, and then we have beaten Cam Newton. And I'm a Seahawk fan, and I think we're probably going to beat Russell Wilson this week too. So this is very exciting. Pretty good. Okay. Uh, um, I'm a big Taylor Heineke fan. I think he's. Uh, I think I just he's just such an athlete, and I love watching him play. He's uh, yeah. He's enjoyed to watch. Uh, back to your original question, I think, uh, look, you, you don't argue with the caretaker. The caretaker, if he says it's the best year ever, uh, then maybe he has reasons for, for that in, in regards to, you know, maybe just because we didn't know we would even have a season and the fact that, you know, we kind of managed to pull together and and, and get a full season in. That's, uh, 
Um, that might be his reason. In regards to the quality of the play on the field, it def- definitely was not the best season. Uh, it definitely was, uh, you know, with no off season and a bunch of quarterback injuries and the kicker stunk. It was, uh, it wasn't the best season. That, that's uh, for sure. But uh, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, I can't remember. It was one of the Fridays, and I was working, and I was going to watch. I pulled the game up because I have to watch a lot on ESPN Plus, kind of on demand because of my work schedule. Yeah, I remember I was turning it on to drive home, and it, it just got to halftime. And Kate was like, uh, "If this is your first time ever watching the CFL, like I'm sorry, like I hope that this is not your introduction." I thought, "Wow, like, it, it was. It must have been some game with Ottawa, right? You know, <laughs> just just assuming." But it, it, it's been a weird. You know, I spend all week talking to smart people, kind of previewing these games, and then sometimes it just doesn't always end up right. I mean, it's just weird. Is that frustrating for you guys trying to cover it on the panel and and you're trying to kind of like spin spin yarn sometimes and say like, well, this is maybe better than it was or worse than it was? Uh, I mean, if you listen to us, we we, we say it. We call it how it is. If a game stunk, I'll... I'll, we'll we'll lead it off by saying that game stunk. There's no no problem with that. Uh, and our uh, our bosses and and uh, um, our producers tell us to just be honest. So we don't try to we don't try to sugarcoat it. And, and uh, the game sucks. You, like you say, you heard Kate you heard Kate say it. It's, it's um, me and Will will say it. If it sucks, it sucks. There's been some some good games. There's been some games that stunk. And and uh, you know when you're watching, the, I'm I'm a I'm a sports better. So there's always, there's always, it's always interesting to me uh, because there's always some some fantasy implications or, or betting implications. So, uh, but yeah, I wouldn't. Definitely hasn't been uh, hasn't been the best football in, in in regards to execution, and and uh, and I think a lot of that is because of quarterbacks, and a lot of that has to do with the offseason. Hey. Besides Winnipeg, right? Because obviously that's the easiest storyline, and you know, thankfully they're not playing this weekend. We can talk about maybe some other, you know, intriguing things. What storyline has surprised you the most? You know, Calgary coming back with the Bo Levi of it. You know, Saskatchewan finally kind of getting things right. What you know, from a sports narrative and watching these uh, these teams, what has impressed you? Oh, impressed me is Winnipeg for sure. I mean, the most the, the storyline that's been surprised me the most, which I think where originally you said is, is Edmonton for sure. I had them, I had them to win the Grey Cup. I mean, preseason because their, their roster was outstanding on paper. Uh, that would be what surprised me the most. Uh, there's their, hey, look, if they would have been a 500 team or, or, you know, barely snuck in the playoffs or that would have, that would have been a surprise from looking at their roster. But the fact that they were as bad as they were, and everybody got cleaned out after a year, and and uh, you know, uh, you know, arguably the worst team in the league. That that was a shock. And, and, and Winnipeg, the dominance of Winnipeg really shocked. I didn't I didn't think that Zach Caleros uh, was going to make it through the year, uh, play play every game and be healthy. That that to me is a surprise. And I, I look, I I, would, I said they're not going to make it. There's no way this guy can play a full season. He's not uh, he, he's not healthy enough, and and uh, and it just won't happen. And then and they didn't have a backup. I didn't believe in Winnipeg at all. I was dead ass wrong. And they've been dominant, and their defense is one of the best ever, um, or you know, amongst the best. And yeah, those would be the two polar opposites, and probably the biggest shock in in this season. Uh, what do you make of Edmonton kind of cleaning house here this week, and and basically just saying we're starting fresh? Yeah. It looks as though, you know, over here from the, the people in Edmonton and, you know, from fans and to alumni. And I just think it, w- it was they were at the point where it wasn't there was it wasn't going to get fixed. And, and, I, and I think you have to it, it was probably just a good move to just rip the bandit off now. I think there was there was so much bad publicity and and and, you know, situations there when, when it comes to, you know. Uh, the history of the team and some of the moves they made and uh, just all that stuff. I don't think it was, it was fixable, unfortunately. So for, from the, forget about the football standpoint. Um, Cause I, th- I think Brock Sunderland had a, assembled a pretty good team. So from the G what the GM's job is to, is to get talent there. I think he had talent, uh, whether or not that talent was um, playing at there. I think a lot of those guys let them down. Um, uh, but in the, the day, you know, the deal, 
read it's uh it's pro football and guys you're gonna get you're gonna get cut and you're gonna get fired if you don't have success especially when you have a you know guys who got paid a lot and, and the expectations were there but they, i think they reached a point of no return uh as an organization as a team they had to just get rid of those guys because uh, i don't think that <laughs> the community was was backing them anymore and that, that's obviously a problem yeah as someone that's you know obviously played for the team you know right run the gray cup with the team i mean what is that it just that's all I've heard lately is the, you know the the negative kind of just perception surrounding that. I mean, it, it kind of I guess began with the name change and then coming into the season, and we still have people about all that stuff. But just knowing that, that this dominant right, you know, for years franchise now is, is maybe one of the more struggling ones in the league. Uh, it, it's a weird turnabout. Yeah, well, the, the, I don't know how what you think in XFL wise. I know you're an expert in all in all football leagues, or you follow them all. Um, but one thing different in, like I said, USFL, XFL, I don't know the turnaround. I think it's probably similar to CFL. Uh, the NFL takes the NFL would take time for an organization to rebuild. The, the CFL, it can, they can rebuild in six months. So it's, it's not all doom and gloom and what happened to a once proud Edmonton franchise and now they're in shambles and, and where we go from here. It's, I'll tell you where you go from here. You hire, you hire a GM. Uh, you, you figure out who your star quarterback is. You get some good Canadians, and next thing you know, you're you're a top of the West, or you're battling with someone else. That's just as simple as it is. Um, so it's not, you know, it is it, this year is a write off, and it sucks. But uh, for the franchise, they just need some goodwill there. Um, the people feeling good about who they hire, and then really, it's there's there's no rebuild, right? You grab, like I said, you grab a good quarterback, and I think they think they already have some in, in Arbuckle and possibly Cornelius. And then, uh, you know, then you grab some, make sure your Canadians are solid and you go from there. Do you think Arbuckle survives all this? Yeah. From what I've heard and I, I don't have the specs on it, but I believe his contract is, is, uh, is all in base salary. So there's nothing to lose. He's, he's not, I don't think he's getting off season money. <clears throat> so he signed an extension, but uh, you, you keep him and you got to battle for the job. And the guys, the guy's shown that he can play football and, and, at a high level. So maybe, maybe it just, he just wasn't a fit in Toronto and maybe, you know, whoever else comes in, maybe they find something, but uh, I think he's, I think he's a gamer and he, he has shown, he has shown in his contract lends to him, to him being there at least get an opportunity. Uh, looking ahead at, at these two kind of semifinal games, uh, obviously the Alouettes, right? You know, former yeah, team of yours as well. Uh, going to Hamilton, weird kind of last weekend where it was, you know, all this speculation. Okay, who's going to be able to host the game? Whatever, you know, Alouettes get blown out, and then we're like, oh, well, that kind of took away a lot of the uh, thoughts on that. And then heading into the to the match itself against Hamilton. Yeah, Montreal kind of played that one. Uh, on the fence, they wanted they wanted to win the game, but they wanted to rest their guys. That's a, that's a slippery slope. So I don't I'm not putting too much into it. Um, you know, the matchup this week in Hamilton is is going to be a good one. Uh, I think they I think that yeah. Well, the one game that Montreal won, Hamilton beat them pretty good in the first game, and then the game that Montreal won was a crazy comeback. Hamilton probably should have won that game. So um, yeah, Montreal's a confident group and got a good a good. Uh, a good vibe to them in regards to, you know, their belief. And, and uh, I don't know, I think, I think Hamilton has got to be favored in, in the game just because of their experience um, and the fact they're at home. But uh, yeah, I think it's going to be, look in the East, any three of those teams could go to the great cup and I wouldn't be surprised. Like I'm not, I don't think any of us would be shocked if Montreal, if Montreal beat Hamilton and then beat Toronto. I wouldn't be shocked. And if, if Hamilton, if Toronto sat there and at, at, with home field and, smacked whoever came in i wouldn't be all that shocked i mean it's it's uh the east is wide it's really wide open and that's why um getting montreal at plus plus 800 or whatever the odds are were yesterday is a really good bet anyone who's who's in and who's looking for action i think that's a that's a pretty good play i think i saw them yesterday at plus 800 or plus 900 to win the great cup which is basically they you know you can you can hedge your you can hedge your bet if you win one game you can hedge and have some good um, some good opportunities, but it's wide open. The West is a whole other deal, obviously. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 we like the Argos, right? They're kind of one of our teams as well. Uh, you know, the 
just how well they've done this year, putting everything together under McLeod and, and obviously with new coach Tim Whitty and, and, you know, here they are sitting first in the, in the East. Uh, thought- can, we, before, can we get the details on why the Argos are your team? I like, I like to want some background here. How did the Argos become one of your teams? You're in, you're in the West coast. Well, so well, BC Lions are my team. That's America's CFL team. That's what I've deemed the BC Lions as. <laughs> Is that right? Okay. And then, okay. Uh, you know, Paul, uh, my co-host, you know, we, we, we did a lot of MLSE talk with the XFL and everything in the off season. Oh, yeah. And so uh, we have, you know, we have a lot of listeners that, you know, one well, of our, you're in bed with, you're in bed with- MLSC and the whole uh, XFL movement is, is your thought process. Well, we, we, did, we talked a lot of Argos. We tracked McLeod Bethel Thompson through the spring league in the offseason last year, so that made a lot of sense. When he came up, we called him the, the king of the CFL back in week two, uh, and then he had his big stumble, but now he's really done well. So, I mean, I think our two bets, we have a lot of uh, Toronto merch that's been sent to us from listeners. So, uh, yeah, Toronto is one of our teams. What have you thought about them? i by calling McLeod Bethel Thompson the the king of the CFL, you lost all credibility, Reed. I think he's turned around. I think he's doing pretty good right now. He's the leading quarterback in the East. He's royalty. He's just not the king. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he he's a baller of nothing else, and it's been it, it's been cool to see. Plus, we've had like literally every single person in the Toronto Argo staff on our show the last few weeks, so uh, it's been good. Uh, what, what what? How have you thought that they've done this year so far? Uh, exceeded expectations. Uh, you know, you have a you have new quarterbacks, kind of. Um, you have a new a new head coach. You uh, you know they they flipped about eighty percent of their team. So you know, I think the expectations were they would be near the bottom of the East, not not winning it and hosting hosting the East final. So yeah, I, I think they've been they've been excellent. I think they've uh, yeah. I'm surprised to be honest. They I like the move. Some of the moves they made. They got a bunch. There's a great example. Reed, and we talk about you know how fast you can turn something around roster wise, and then when we talk about the Elks and and the doom and gloom, look how fast like they just went out and signed. The Argos went out and signed you know twenty five veteran players that all made their roster and and flipped it up completely, and it's a whole new team, and they were able to do what they did. So yeah, I'm I'm a big fan. Similar to you, I uh, you know I'm close with a lot of guys on that uh, crew and team and staff and and I, I do and I do cheer for them I obviously have a lot of people on all all teams but uh yeah I think their story is a good story that the reality is is um we all want Toronto which is the uh, quote unquote uh, center of the universe and in, in Canadian universe uh to, to be successful it helps it helps the league and and uh they've had their struggles so I to me it's uh you know it's a good story when they do well. Uh, getting to the other side here before we let you go, uh, talking with the West, to me, a little more of a coin flip. I mean, I feel pretty good about Hamilton going in, but obviously you've dissuaded, you know, you've given your, uh, you know, made me ponder that a little bit. But uh, we have Calgary and Saskatchewan a little bit more. I will be the favorite to me. If I had to pick one team that would come out of the East, that Hamilton will probably be the favorite. But, okay. Well, so so Hamilton going. Uh, so we have you know Bo Levi going up against Cody Fajardo again. You know we we have a mixed pass with Cody Fajardo. We've made fun of him in the past, and we've gotten he's he's blocked us on social media. We didn't try to get all that going. Uh, I get the, can you tell me what? Can you tell me what, what? How you made fun of him? I got to hear. You can't just throw that out there. I don't know what. What did you, why'd you make fun of Cody? So there was an article that came out that he used uh, chicken McNuggets in place of curse words. And I, uh, I said, isn't that funny? That's why people make fun of Cody online. Didn't even tag the man. Didn't even tag the man in the post. Just tweeted it out. And the next day we were blocked. So I actually, we did a, uh, we did a book cameo with Cody. Uh, I, I hijacked it and we did. This is really fun. You might enjoy listening to our podcast. We do a lot of different fun things, but we had, uh, we've done it in the past because we are the Mark cast. So we had Cody uh, congratulate our friend Mark for getting his cast taken off. And then we do a bunch of like splicing and editing. And so it sounds like he listens to the Mark cast. <laughs> very, very nice. Yeah, this is, but you might enjoy our show. You might want to pass this along, tell Matt Dunnigan. And you, they, you guys might get a hoot as like a pregame show for the pregame show. Well, the, the McNuggets and the curse words, I could, I'm already chuckling to myself. So I, I'm sure I'd enjoy it, yeah. Uh, anyway, so so what do we make of this? What do we make of, you know, uh, Bo Levi's back, right? Calgary's back. They were like two and five and everyone thought they were done. And now here they are. They're, you know, in the semifinals. Uh, well, I think they, they, they got a, 
They have uh, a coach who's as good as anybody in Dickey and a, and a pretty sharp offensive mind and a quarterback who's who's been an MOP and, and a great cup champ. So, I mean, it's, it starts and ends with that. If you have if you have a quarterback that in, in clutch situations uh, you think is a gamer and you have a coach that, you know, I, I think can scheme, can scheme up in, in, in a one-game spot, uh, they have a really good defense as well. So this is a – I think that, you know, I think Calgary's – you know, got a shot. That's the other team. That's the other team with long shot odds that that I like is Calgary. They, they are a long shot, but I like them because they have, like I said, they have a quarterback that's they have a quarterback that is uh, you know an MVP caliber and and uh, and when he's playing well, obviously not now. Um, and they have a good defense over the last two months. Been great. <laughs> we have we have visitors. Uh, who- My wife. Uh, I think she's doing a peloton here. All right, <laughs> that's okay. We'll get you out of here soon. Uh, so, who are you taking between that between uh, Saskatchewan and Calgary? I'm not giving you picks in the beginning of the week. This is not the way it works. Well, this isn't going to air till Friday, so you're safe. Uh, okay, you can keep it under wraps. I'll keep, no, it, no. I'll keep Davis. Yeah, I'll keep your your pick. Gonna, yeah, we're not going to blow up the internet with my pick here. Yeah. Uh, um, gosh. I honestly, uh, right now, I honestly don't know. How about this? I can give you a lean because I, I, I still have to make a pick, and I haven't made a pick yet, and I haven't decided yet. My my early lean, early in the week, um, I probably Hamilton's at home, so I probably lean Hamilton at, on this that side at home. We're talking about the East right now. Um, I'm a Montreal guy. That's that's my team. So I'll probably I, by the end of the week, I wouldn't be surprised if I sway over and. And cheer, cheer my house. But uh, in regards to the West, it's uh, I like Calgary for that for that reason. In in the semi, I think it's you know, like I said, it's it's uh, I just I like what you know. On the road is tough, but I I like I have some trust, and I don't know why I do because he hasn't looked good. Bo Bo hasn't looked great. I, I don't know why, but I just I I believe in in a big game. I just feel like he's he's a gamer and has a chance to get done. Their defense has been real damn good, and I think been. Under underappreciated. That's good. Uh, do you feel like I have talked with a lot of people that feel that whoever wins in the West is kind of going into the buzz saw that is Winnipeg here? Like they're kind of the walkers in the North that are waiting. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, it's gonna be real tough for whoever you know <laughs> for Saskatchewan to get through, and then you have the whole COVID situation where traveling. There's gonna there's probably gonna be guys on both those teams who aren't available. Obviously, that doesn't affect Winnipeg because they're they're at home, they don't have to travel. So there's there's travel restrictions on guys who aren't vaccinated. So there's there's that to come into play. There's the yeah, I just the weather in Winnipeg can be cold as heck, and, and Winnipeg's Winnipeg's legit. Uh, so yeah, I, I can give you a West final pick right now, uh, three weeks in advance. If you want, I can give you a Great Cup pick if you really want one. It's uh, it'd be pretty it'd be pretty easy, but uh, we'll see what happens. That's that's why they play the game. Football is different than baseball and basketball and hockey where you play a best of five or a best of seven and and usually usually at the end of it the best team wins that's not the case in, in football so one you get a you know a block punt uh, a block punt or a kick return to the house and a, and a, and a tip ball and next thing you know the Winnipeg Blue Bombers are going home so so uh, let's just let's just see how it plays out but I'm, I'm excited to I'm excited to let it all play out. Yeah, I mean, and obviously the last couple of weeks with Winnipeg, you know, resting people and everything. But, you know, back when they were playing full strength, you know, the Argos were really the only ones that uh, had really any, you know, got the win over them. You know, really, it was like the Russian got cut, right, and Rocky, and it, you show that they're vulnerable. And so it, it does seem... If anything, that storyline is kind of at least what I'm hoping for. You know, at least it's a competitive Grey Cup. I mean, we're we're going all the work up there. We're traveling. You know, we're doing all the things. So I hope that it is not Winnipeg. You know, forty five to zero or whatever. It's good. It's gonna be a great week. When I look forward to to meeting you guys up there and seeing you. I'm glad uh, glad you're able to come uh, in town. It's gonna be a good week. It'll be fun. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time coming on. You know, the week of Thanksgiving, I appreciate it, and uh, hopefully, we won't spoil any of your picks. And when when this episode airs, and it should be good that later this week, I appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Reed. Appreciate it. Well, I am excited today. We, uh, you were busy with work stuff last week. It was well worth it. I feel like now we're talking Saskatchewan Rough Riders going into the semifinals. We have Luke Melinder here. Uh, how are you doing today? 
I'm good, man. You know what? Uh, when it comes to just sort of the the, the topic of conversation, um, as a former player, to when it's Wednesday, so today's day one, right? Uh, a lot of those guys walked into the 9 a.m. meeting um, excited about uh, excited about you know what the game plan is, what the strategies around their their various positions are, you know where the where the opportunities may be um but more importantly you know right now you're you're excited to be with the guys because this is sort of the time this is where where all the locker room comes together right because because none of the incentives exist you know you're not you're not out there worrying about individual accomplishments anymore because you know as much as you want to talk about team success and it's about the team up it's about the team you know during the season there are still things that you want to you know individually you want to you know to do and um here it's just about moving on, right? One and done. Let's go get as many checks as we can, and let's go get us a ring. Yeah, you know, a lot was made this week with Hamilton and and, and Montreal kind of going back and forth, some trash talking, you know, friendly rivalry kind of stuff. Mm. And you know, basically that we're reset now. You know, home field advantage or who's in the standings? It's it's everyone's kind of reset now. We're going into the playoffs. Does that as a player? How do you change that mindset now? It's like, this is, I mean, this is for real now. Not that not all this stuff matters the whole time. You know, it's, it's funny because uh, what happens is, is only a few players actually understand that. So right now teams need to lead on their vets, you know, the guys that have been there before. And, you know, you spend a lot of time, especially as a veteran who's been there, you know, bringing the young guys along, right. And bringing the guys who may not get it. They don't have to be young, but some guys just, you know, haven't gotten it. Some guys have, haven't been on teams before that have won anything. Um, so, you know, you, you spend a lot of time during the year bringing those specific people along. And I think that, you know, um, now where, where every moment is magnified, right? Like when second and second and six, right on the three yard line in a, in a, in a 14, 14 game with three minutes left on the clock, in the regular season, that's the situation. But in the playoffs, the situation is, oh man, we could probably, we could be going home if, if we're not successful in it, right? Defensively or offensively. That right there, that alone, the, the, the presence of a sudden stop in professional sports changes the entire game plan. And I think that, you know, when, when it comes to the CFL playoffs and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, you know, they're going to have to lean on the guys that have been there before, because again, you're not going to be, you're not going to spend the entire game up by, by 10. You're going to be in, in moments and situations, especially in that fourth quarter where you're down, right. Or where you need a stop where you need a, to string a drive together. And, and time moves really slow if you're on the other side of that, that, that the potential result. So um, right now it's about the guys that have been there and, um, and, and, uh, and them helping, you know, and caring. That's why when they talk about in the offseason, you know, re-signing the core guys, that's why guys like that are so important. That's why you need your core guys right now because they've been there. And, and they're the guys you need to lean on in the, when, the, uh, when the adversity is the thickest. Uh, it's interesting. So I think that, I mean, in, maybe I'm wrong. I, I feel pretty good about Hamilton going into the East. I know that we, I, and we've done other interviews today talking and I want to get your thoughts as well, but with the West, it really seems like it's this even match, right? We have Calgary really picking up steam, Bo Levi, you know, Cody and the Rough Riders always good, but then you're still going against Winnipeg then the next week, right? So it's like whoever gets out of that, you're still kind of in the bus. Off. What are you making of the West division playoffs right now? I think the West is wide open. I don't subscribe. I think that Winnipeg is a really good team. I don't subscribe to the, to the narrative though, that they're unbeatable. Um, I think that Calgary and Saskatchewan last time Calgary and Saskatchewan or Winnipeg into last time we saw sort of a playoff game in Saskatchewan, it wasn't the great cup. It was the Western final, right? And the crossbar, you know, everybody makes notion, but you really got the feeling, though, that that game was was the Grey Cup. I think the same way about. I think that I look at this as the 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 you know Calgary is 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 like you said they're they're playing at a high level. Um, they seem to be operating on, on on efficient cylinders. But Saskatchewan, to be honest with you, they can beat Calgary. If there's any team that understands what Calgary is about and how they can have success. It's the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. More importantly, it's 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 the coaching staff. Um, 
Jason Shivers doesn't get enough credit. Jason Shivers, since he's been a defensive coordinator in this league, has done a fantastic job. One of the things that Jason Shivers has also picked up on is how to is how to make Bo Levi Mitchell um, uncomfortable and 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 really put him in a position where you know turnovers can can create massive opportunities for for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Jason Shivers is going to come with a game plan that does not cater to Bo Levi Mitchell's strength. I'm, I've been always surprised in the past that more teams don't just copy what Shivers and Chris Jones have done against Bo Levi Mitchell in the past. I think that there's a, there is not necessarily a blueprint, but there is a way that you can, you can figure out, you know, and, and for me, what you got to realize is, is between the hashes, right? The, the distance between the hashes um, and there's like a seven yard box. So take the hashes and then look, look at this like seven yard box or six yard box. If you take, if you take the hashes and you create a six yard box from line of scrimmage, six yards up, if you take that away from Bo Levi Mitchell, you're going to have chances because then he's going to have to, he wants to throw long, but he's not a, he's not a, he's not a cowboy, man. He, he's a guy that likes to throw jabs and then throw hooks, you know? And if you just get him to just get out there and have to throw hooks the entire game, that's where the turnovers come on. Come in. And that's my opinion, but I think that uh, I think the Saskatchewan can beat the Calgary Stampeders. I don't see this as something where, but again, everything is going to have to work, right? Because Calgary is playing at a really high level, and um, and, and when I say everything is going to have to work, I, I think that you look at the offensive side of the ball. You can't turn the ball over, and you need to be able to uh, dominate the line of scrimmage this game. That's that's traditionally I have played in this league for a long time, and now I'm on the side, you know. Nine-year career, which meant nine years of playing the Calgary Stampeders, and then you know the media side of things, uh, hit him in the mouth. One of the more physical games, right? But uh, if you can out physical Calgary, you got a good shot of winning that game. Out physical Calgary on that offside of the, uh, offensive side of the ball, and then force Bo Levi Mitchell to have to just throw deep the majority of the time. Don't let him. Don't let him. Don't give him the first six yards. Are you surprised at the bounce back? I mean, I know everyone says long season. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. But the Calgary went from really could have been a forgettable season, right? All the injuries and everything. Coming back here, I mean, they're in the playoff semifinals. Yeah, no, I'm not surprised at all. You know, the, 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 the those who are waiting for the Calgary demise are going to be waiting for a very long time. Uh, I'll tell you when to start really looking at Calgary's demise. The, the minute Huff Nagel and 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 – Dave Dickinson walk out of there, then you've got a shot. As long as Huff Nagel's there, Calgary's not going anywhere. And that's why, you know, you, you spend so much time, especially in Saskatchewan, right? We, as soon as Calgary loses two games in a row, yes, it's over for them. They're done. Done like that. No, 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 man. If Huff's there, they're going to be a good team, and they're going to be playing at a high level when it matters the most at the end of the year. And uh, it's why they've had the sustained success that they've had. It's why they're one of the top organizations in the league. And that's why they will always be one of the top organizations in the league as long as Huff Nagel's there, you know, running the ship. Uh, on the Saskatchewan side, you know, a lot was made earlier this year. You know, Cody wanted more weapons, getting frustrated. You know, we had we made fun some episodes. We, you know, is Cody the man in black? You know, he kind of was wearing the black hat for a little while. Uh, really seems to be gelling now. What do you make of that? Did they finally just get all the kinks worked out? I don't think they have the kinks worked out. I think that um, – I think that Duke Williams was a huge signing for them. I don't know. Like I've said this before, I don't know what they're paying Duke Williams, but he's worth every penny. Um, you know, the, the, the riders are, have struggled when it comes to, you know, manufacturing consistent big plays, right? Anything 20 plus yards or over on the offensive side is considered a big play in my eyes. And those just haven't come um, consistently throughout the year. I think that Duke Williams gives them a real, he, what he's given them is, is he's given them a, a big play guy. More importantly, he's given them a tough player. Like Duke's the type of guy that, that could play, uh, that could play defense. Right. I, I wouldn't say that about any of the other wide receivers. You know what I mean? It just is what it is. Don't get your feelings hurt. It's just, the, it's just the truth. None of you guys could be a linebacker except probably. Duke, right. So, so, so you got to lean on him. Right. But Calgary is going to know you got to lean on. Him. And I think that the, the potential and some of the other guys, right? Like I think that Shaq Evans, for instance, has to have a big game. But in order for Shaq to have a big game, they got to stop. They got to they got to really find ways to let him loose, right? Like none of this five yard dig route type of deal consistently, right? Stop giving them, you know, instead of like figure out a way to get them downfield, right? Get them in some situations where it's funny they had a jump ball situation to Shaq last week, 
that he should have come down with. And, you know, and I pointed it out. He should have caught that ball, right? But at the same time, too, part of me is also saying, well, that's what also happens when you don't give them those opportunities consistently, right? You know what I mean? Is is, is your timing your timing just isn't isn't where it is. It's not as sharp. And, you know, now you're relying on just, you know, a little luck a little bit more than you normally would in those situations because you're not putting them in that situation. So I think now you, you've got to, if, if there's any time to cut it loose, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders offensively, now is it. And, and, you know, Shaq, Shaq needs to be a big part of that in order for them to be successful. A lot was made of this last week. You know, it was weird, right? Hamilton, Montreal, who's going to host, you know, uh, Montreal loses, right, to Ottawa. So a lot of the, you know, the weekend and the jockeying for position was kind of gone. But a lot was made, especially in that Saskatchewan loss. You know, are these players, you know, I know we're not, playing everyone and we're sitting some people in there, but like, are they playing like they want to be here? I feel like maybe I saw you tweet some stuff. I saw some other comments online. What'd you make of that? You've got to want, you've got to want, or you've got to understand the nature of, of, of the beast. Um, for instance, I thought it was I thought it was a mistake not not having Cody out there and at least playing a half, like right, because I didn't feel that the offense was was clicking at a hundred percent. I didn't feel like they were as cohesive. I didn't feel like they were as in sync as they probably could be going into playoffs. And I looked at that game as another opportunity to uh, to um, to get there. I think that um, in those situations. You've, you've got to understand as a player that you're, you're in one of the biggest, you're in one of the coolest job interviews in the world. This is an awesome, like that's, you know, when they call athletes, pro athletes, the one percenters, though that game last week was one of those situations because you spend all week hearing everybody talk to you about, oh, well, you know, it doesn't mean much. And oh yeah, really? Because every single time you're out there on the field, you're, you, you're interviewing for a job. That's the, it's why coach Tressman, Mark Tressman was so good in the Canadian football. He talks about honoring the game. You know, you have an opportunity to take advantage of every single rep. And I felt like last week, instead of understanding the job opportunity, right. And the job interview that you're always in, in professional football, every single rep is an, is, is an interview. I felt like that wasn't, that could have been focused on a lot more. And I felt like there were some guys that were really disinterested in, in aspects of that game. And, and when that happens, you, you not only risk putting yourself in a situation where someone's going to get hurt, but more importantly, you saw the momentum that you had going for you heading into the playoffs. I think that, you know, that game could have been approached a little bit more um, I, energetically, if that's a word, um, from all, not just the team, not just the players either, but from the coaching staff and from the organization as a whole. I think that there could have been more energy put behind that game to where where you could have come away really feeling good about the next step, which was going to be Calgary. Instead, what you what you got was was having to ignore what just happened. Don't worry, guys. You know what? It's cool. That game didn't matter. We're focused on Calgary. Whereas it could have been, man. It doesn't stop. We just went in and pounded that team and we're, 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 we're on an up. Right. So, so there, that, that's sort of where I looked at it is, as, as, as a missed opportunity, but more importantly, when those things do creep in those feelings of something not being as important as, as it, as it may have been, if you were in a different situation, that's when you need the guys who who are out there reminding guys, Hey, at the end of the day, this is also a job interview. And you've been doing this job interview for like 14, 15 weeks and it never stops, period. Well, that's the thing. And I mean, we just have an article today in the show, you know, talking about reworking the player contracts, right? Coming into this bargaining in the off season and, you know, working for longer contracts for right now, all these players are on one year deals. And it's like, you know, whatever happens this year, maybe you're going to be somewhere else next year. And like you said, that visibility, other people are scouting you. Other people are seeing that stuff. And, and like you said, that giving that effort, no matter kind of what the stakes in the game are, I think, yeah, it's like a job interview, like you said. You can't, you can't, you can't escape. The film doesn't lie, right? The film doesn't lie. You know, you have to, uh, that, that's going to be, that's, that's your resume. That's right. Like, is, and that's what people in the, 
you know, civilian life as, as, as it's called in the locker room is it's tough to understand, right? Like people, people, will, Hey, you know what? You have an interview to be uh to be a banker, this job opening and you get a call back. Well, you know what you do? You figure out, you know, Hey, well, you've already figured out the best way to word your resume, right. To make yourself stand out. Right. And now you're going to figure out, okay, well, what am I going to say? What am I going to, what am I going to position? What am I going to, what are the, what is the foundation I'm going to personally stand on in this interview? In football, there ain't, you can't manipulate a resume in football, right? I can't be like, you know what? I took out the garbage at Tim Hortons for seven straight years, right? That's what I did at Tim Hortons. I can't, in football, I can't say, I, I was the, uh, I was the cleanliness director, for Tim Hortons for seven years. You know what I mean? Like I can't manipulate in football. What you are on film is what you are. There's no manipulating that. So if you're a guy, for instance, one of my problems in early on in my career, if you're a guy that has problems playing with your pad level low, you're a guy that has problems playing with your pad level. low. Can't manipulate that. Cause we see it on film. So that's, that's, you know, again, like that's, that's the film doesn't lie. Men lie, women lie, numbers don't, neither does film. Right. So that's the opportunity that you always have as a professional athlete is to create a resume that's actually truthful. Right. And those, that's a big task, man, because what's on film is what's on film. And it could go either way. Uh, obviously, you know, being the analyst, you know, covering Saskatchewan, do you going into this game, are you able to have a, a you know, favorite of who you think is going to win objectively? Yeah, I want Saskatchewan to win. <laughs> but who? Yeah, who I hate watched, Calgary. But I spent nine years of my, my my career not liking Calgary. It's not going to stop on the media. So I'm going to be objective, and I'm going to call a spade a spade. So if so and so is not getting a block, and Calgary gets a sack because of it, then that's on so and so. I'm not changing that. But in my heart of hearts, yeah, I want Saskatchewan to win, man. You know, that's uh, it's. You know, the and and the reason why is because the community here just rallies around the team so much. You know what I mean? Like we're you're literally the crown jewel. It was funny, I was in a meeting today. Today and and, and I was I was it was with my CEO and, and you know I'm I'm the vice president of the Canadian Red Cross here in Saskatchewan and we were talking about sports and we were talking about the CFL and Saskatchewan in general. And he said, you know, it's funny because Montreal, the Alouettes, they play in McGill Stadium. Like, there's nothing about their home stadium that's theirs, right? Like, those are soccer lockers in, in, in where you get – you know what I mean? Like, it's not conducive. That locker room setup isn't conducive to a football team. It's not theirs. But then when you look at Saskatchewan, that stadium's for the Rough Riders. They say, oh, yeah, it's a multi-event place. No, it's not. It's the Saskatchewan football arena where the Saskatchewan Rough Riders play. And the reason why it exists is because of the community and the success the Saskatchewan Rough Riders have had since probably about 2005, 2006. So that's why I'm pulling for the Riders because the community is so engaged in football. And realistically, it's given me opportunities. Why would I not pull for the team that, I, like, Luke Mullender isn't a color commentator in Toronto. Right. Luke Mullinder in Toronto wasn't a bully prevention ambassador for the Canadian Red Cross uh, as in his career. Luke Mullinder wasn't signed. Right. Like, so, yeah, I'm, I'm pulling for Saskatchewan. I've always wanted I always want Saskatchewan to win. But, man, if I don't think they're going to win. I'm going to let you know. I think you played terrible. Yep, you played terrible. And a spade's a spade. You have to be. It's OK to to be law to, to, to one team to win. But I'm still going to be as objective as ever. Or at least I hope to be on uh, on Sunday. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we get that a lot, right? Where if we criticize, you know, the CFL or we talk XFL, you know, it's like, well, you, you can criticize and still support, right? It's not hating. Look, look here's the deal. You're never going to make everybody happy. I'm not going to sit around and try to think of ways to make somebody happy. The reason why that is, is if I make that one person happy, there's three people behind that person that don't like what I just did. So I'm going to be me, right? Fat guy, former athlete, bald headed, loves cheeseburgers. That's the guy I'm going to be, you know, I'm not going to try to be anybody else because, because somebody has a problem with, with, with something that you're going to do. It's just the way we're the world we live in. Social media is set up to where everybody can have an opinion on something. And 
that's why, you know what, people who, are, who don't agree with you have a lot of access and, and have an opinion that, that they can amplify. And, that's, and you know what, honestly, it's a good thing too. Right? There's, there's a good and bad to that. Uh, so now that we know that Saskatchewan's going all the way to the Grey Cup, going to win, right? <laughs> uh, real quick, I do want to get your thoughts on the East, right? Hamilton, Montreal, kind of, you know, obviously been going in against Toronto. Uh, quick thoughts on that before we let you go. So I think Hamilton is going to represent the uh, – actually, I think Hamilton's going to win the Montreal game. I do. Patrick Levels is going to have to – have to be accountable for, 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 for guaranteeing. He's not Mark Messier, <laughs> right? Don't do that. Don't, don't guarantee that. Um, I think Hamilton's going to beat Montreal. Um, I think as long as they're, they're responsible with the football, I think that as long as their offense doesn't go out there and turn the ball over there, they're going to be fine. Hamilton is – Hamilton's better when you look at the coaches. They're one of the most well-coached teams in the league, and that's what's going to – Tommy Condell. And it's not just Orlando Steinhauer. It's Tommy Condell. It's, it's Jeff, it's Jeff Reinbold. You know what I mean? Like, they've got some, a great staff. And that's why I think the, um, the interesting matchup is going to be them versus Toronto um, because Toronto with Chris Jones is a different Toronto team, right? They've always been capable of throwing interceptions Toronto offensively. But with Chris Jones, they're capable of taking the ball back. And I think that, again, you know, Hamilton, Hamilton needs to be able to avoid turnovers, whatever quarterback's in there. So I think that's going to be – but, uh, you know, I, again, I'm not sold on Winnipeg. I'm not. And it's not just because I sit in Saskatchewan. I think that any team in the playoffs is beatable. And uh, if you don't have your A game, you know, on, on any given day, any down and distance, then there's opportunity there. Right. And one of the things that we do know is there are weaknesses in the Winnipeg team. Right. I mean, it was all throughout the year. You knew that, you know, their kicker, their kicking game wasn't as good as their defense and offense. Right. So, again, and you're always and here's the other thing, man. You're always one injury away. You're always one injury away from looking real different out there and having a team take advantage of that. Uh, well, Luke, this has been, uh, well, uh, I've been excited for this because I feel like this delivered. I feel like I've heard a little bit of criticism, criticism this week that so maybe the CFL isn't doing enough to promote these games. I think that you have done a lot to, uh, you know, excite <laughs> and promote this right now. I mean that in terms of speaking passionately about it. And uh, I mean that. I, I, I think this is exciting. I appreciate your time today and, and kind of uh, giving your thoughts. And it's been really fun. You know what, man? There's, it's the CFL. I'm I'm not I'm not I'm worried about the CFL, man. I, I, they've given me also the, the league has given me all sorts of opportunities. I I feel so blessed to be able to be a part of the league as a player, but now also on the media side, I'm worried about the media. Um, we've got to figure things out on the business front. Uh, we've got to figure out a way to get better coaching in here. Like for instance, you know, you don't want a guy like Jason Shivers to be the last great young coach, up and coming coach. Because if you, who now pays a lot of attention, and, and it's funny, I, I, would, I would challenge anybody else, point out some young guys other than Jason Shivers and Buck Pierce, right? That are So there's a lot I'm concerned about in the Canadian Football League, but it's probably why I'm really looking forward. Because, because just like any other businessman, and just like a football game in general, man, it's not about what's ahead. It's, it's controlling what you can control in the moment. So let's just all, all enjoy this. Playoffs are here, man. We're all jacked up. It's not going to be minus 40, which is good. So, uh, yeah, let's roll, man. I'm excited. Go Riders. Uh, well, we will be rooting for the Riders. Uh, and uh, sometimes friend of the show, Cody Fajardo, will be rooting for him as well. And I think it yeah. should be a good time. So thank you again. There you go, man. It was a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity, brother. Well, I'm excited today. We have Morley Scott here. Originally, when we booked this, we, you know, we assumed maybe Edmonton would be out of the runnings. And we thought, well, I guess we can talk some, you know, semifinals. Now we actually have a lot of stuff to talk about with Edmonton. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, it's been fun to watch you the last uh, week and a half. You know, Edmonton had all their road games. It was like the traveling gnome. I would see your photos everywhere and, you know, videos walking to the city. What's it been like the last, uh, what, 10 days or so? Uh, on that road trip, it, it, it was it was interesting. It was, it was you know it's not what football is about really because you're not supposed to play that many games in that few days in football. They play once a week for a reason, right? Because it's a very demanding sport, very hard on the body, and to play three and seven days. And in, you know in the CFL, 
they have a lot of, I know NFL, you know, they go Sunday, Thursday a lot, and they go Monday, Sunday uh, on short weeks. But the CFL has a few of those short week dates, but not like this, nothing like this. And I think it was really something that no one's gone through since the 50s. Uh, but in the 50s, it was in the playoffs, and they were, you know, they were playing in the same city, and it was it was a lot, obviously, the game was a lot different. I don't think uh, the physical part of the game was as high back then. But yeah, it, it, was, it was hard on the players. I mean, they would land, they would go from one city to the other. They landed in the second city, and immediately they went to a big ballroom where the team had uh, 15 or 20 massage therapists set up with tables and the players just walked right in and, and they worked on their bodies and, and, you know, they drank a lot of water and ate the right foods. And that was all they could really do. Um, I mean, another thing, you know, people talked about uh, a lot on the trip is the fact that, you know, it's three games in seven days, but they never got to practice and practice is such a very important part of football. Football is all about the reps in practice, right? And they never got to practice uh, for a week. So for two games, they played without a practice and that's just unheard of in football. And I think that paid a toll as well. And I think that final game in DC, whatever, 43, 40, 43 to 10 or whatever the score was so way too much to wait too little from the Elks perspective. But I think we saw how it shook out. And I, and I think looking back on it, what did you expect in that last game? I mean, uh, you can't really be surprised that it happened the way it happened. Uh, they got a win, which is good to end the eight game uh, losing streak at the time and uh, get some positive vibes going into the, into the end of the season as, as they all head home for the off season. Yeah, I, it was, it was good. We, we were at the cracking game Friday. We came home. I was tracking the BC Lions. You know, that's my team. That's America's team, the BC Lions. And so we, uh, it, 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 I mean, at least it was good to end the season on a high note that way because BC has also not had the most tremendous, yeah. uh, second half. So, you know, it was at Edmonton's expense, but I will take a 43 to 10 victory, uh, any day of the week. Yeah, for sure. That's a big score. I mean, uh, but you did, uh, the Lions did beat up on a pretty, t- a pretty yeah. fragile team at that point, for sure. Uh, physically and mentally, I think worn down uh, just because of what they had gone through, but, uh, they got their paychecks. That's what it was all about, right? It was either uh, play that game in the middle of the week against Toronto or not get the paycheck for it. And uh, they chose this, and I don't blame them for choosing that way. And and uh, but they had to suffer the consequences, which was three games in seven days. Yeah, you know, I'm glad. You know, glad everyone got there safe. You know, got home. Everything worked out. I, you know. Obviously, all the news came out this week with Edmonton, you know, really starting from, you know, scratch again. I, I remember months ago having your broadcast partner, Dave Campbell, on talking about, you know, the, the rebrand and the logos and kind of the excitement. Uh, you know, there was a lot of positive vibes going into the season. I mean, what has just the last, what, four or five months of, of your life been like just in terms of that kind of? So uh, many yeah, so many positive vibes after they uh, they they unveiled the the new logo and the new name. Everybody was pretty happy, and then two weeks into the season, they're zero and two, and everyone's going after two losses at home, and everyone's wondering, oh man, what's going on here? And, and then they came back. They 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 won in Vancouver against the Lions to to go to one and two, and then they had their COVID outbreak that shut them down for a couple of weeks, and uh, they ended up going to Calgary to win in Calgary on Labor Day, which is something they haven't done in a decade. Uh, And, you know, it's funny, like that game to me, nothing continued from that point that should have. I mean, they'd won two in a row. They survived the COVID scare. Uh, Trevor Harris had thrown four touchdown passes in the game. He led the league in passing yards at that point. And about uh, three or four weeks later, he's gone. Uh, traded and and not playing loses his job and then things you know uh, we heard on on uh, locker cleanup day uh, before he was fired Brock Sunderland was saying the the bus ride home from Calgary he's thinking I'm sitting in, on the bus thinking we got it going now we're two and two we won two in a row Trevor's really fired and everything's going well and they never won again until November like that was Labor Day and they didn't win again until mid November which is just ridiculous um no one no one saw it coming no one saw it coming it shouldn't have happened it, it this is a better team than you know I know the old saying is you are what your record says you are but this wasn't a 3 and 11 team i mean it, it they had personnel that should be better than what they were uh but they had a lot of guys have off years a lot of guys have bad years and they just for some reason, they just didn't become a team this year. They just didn't become a team and play together as a team. And I think that really showed. And uh, for whatever reason, they just they just went in the tank after winning those two in a row and just could not swim their way out of it. It seemed a lot was made. And again, you know, we're, we're kind of coming into the CFL now, you know, trusting what other people have said. But when, you know, the season started, Elizondo came in. You know, it, it seemed like a lot of players were cut, right? We had like the Derek Dennis's, right? The, the, the upsetness and all that, you know, the, the culture change, right? Kenny Stafford, right? Was that, um, 
is that where all this kind of started was letting go of the wrong people and and uh, I'm not sure about that. Excuse me. Uh, I think the culture change comment from Jamie Elizondo was more to say something to get the media to stop asking him questions because, uh, you know, he didn't want to talk about why Katie Stafford was released and he kept getting asked him three or four times and he just said he wasn't a cultural fit. Uh, I think he just wanted to say something. I think that got overblown a little bit. Uh, maybe it was the wrong choice of words to use uh, because it, it did throw some shade on Katie Stafford, who who I like, I've always liked. He's been a good soldier uh, for the organization for a lot of years, won a great cup here, played a big role in in uh, winning the great cup that season and yeah i i just think that that got overblown a little bit but i i think more than anything there was uh, a bit of a, a a disconnect in the dressing room and i think it started with the vaccination process uh, because a lot of the leaders a lot of the star players weren't vaccinated at the time and i think that created a bit of a problem especially when they had to sit down you know, for two weeks and risk losing a paycheck or more if, if they didn't get it under control during that week uh, before the Labor Day game. So I think that's where it started. And I, I, you know, it just grew from there. And and for whatever reason, this team, as I said earlier, just didn't become a team. They just couldn't, they just couldn't get on the same page. I don't even know if they're in the same book at some times. Right. So it was, uh, it was a very difficult season I, in, in the time I've been, I've been broadcasting Elks games, which is 11 years now. I've never seen this kind of disconnect with a team and, and it shouldn't have been that way considering they had to spend so much time together right you know everyone talks about bonding as a team and spending time together all they could do was spend time with each other at the stadium uh, and and then go home right that was pretty much all they they were allowed to do for the most part of the season until they eased some restrictions so it doesn't make a lot of sense to me and i don't know if we'll ever figure out what happened unless there is something that happened behind the scenes that someone's going to tell us about eventually but it to me it's just uh it's just a weird season it's going to have a lot of question marks for a long long time Obviously, we don't want to see anyone lose their jobs, right? Get fired. You know, we want everyone to be. But is this, you know, with the season ticket holders and the in the fan base and everything? I mean, was this the right move to really just start from the bottom? I think it was the best move for the fan base. Uh, not totally convinced it was the best move football wise uh, to 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 gun all three of them at once because that's I I don't know if there's ever been a professional football team that's done that like fire their president their GM and their coach all at the same news conference right I don't know if that's ever happened before and it really puts a lot of pressure on people who are running the franchise now not only to run the franchise correctly in the off season and to hire the guys who are going to be the replacement. So it's going to be difficult for sure. But I, I have never seen un, uh, a fan base so upset and and talking with their wallets. I mean, uh, they had uh, 20, you know, 22, 23, 24,000 for their last three home games announced. But there was, you know, anywhere from eight to 12,000 fans at the games. People who actually bought tickets didn't go. And that's got to be a sign that something's wrong, right? Uh, the, the, the rollout uh, with some of the things that happened uh, with the fans at the start of the season with, you know, they implemented a few new things like electronic ticketing and a clear bag uh, uh, access. Uh, you know, you couldn't bring any duffel bags or anything in that weren't clear. Uh, that didn't go very smoothly. They laid off a ton of staff during uh, COVID, which everybody did. But when they came back, on the limited number, they couldn't get back to the fans fast enough. And fans were, you know, getting upset. I mean, I got probably 10 emails from fans saying, hey, can you help me? I can't get anyone to answer the phone. I can't get anyone to return my email. Uh, I can't get anyone to tell me how I get my tickets. Um, and, you know, CFL is is an older fan base, and uh, a lot of them are still using flip phones yeah. or no phones at all. And, you know, they introduced an electronic ticket uh, uh, program, which is commonplace in sports now. It's not, it's not new, but it was for the first time it was activated in Edmonton. And people without smartphones are going, what do I do? How do I get in? Right. And they just couldn't get answers in enough time. And I think that the board of directors then had people reaching out to them. And I just think the amount of complaints throughout the season was a big part of, of why the change at the president role was made. Uh, and, and the fans were so against uh, the GM and the coach, uh, you know, every, every Facebook post, every tweet, the response was just fire the coach, fire the yeah. GM. Why are these guys still here? Let's get on with this. Right. So, you know, throwing the name change with some people will never get over. And it just led to too much fan irritation. And, you know, it's the lifeblood of your franchise. If you don't have fans, you don't have a team, right. Especially the CFL where it's a gate driven league. So, you know, a, a team that, you know, 
was averaging in the, in the last five years, 30,000 plus a game, all of a sudden they're down in the low twenties of, of paid and under 20 in actual and something had to be done. And, and I don't know if it was, you know, I, I feel bad for Jimmy Elizondo, especially because, you know, he just, he just got a, he just got a raw deal. He just did. He just, things just went the wrong way for him. You know, he's a first year coach, made some mistakes, obviously. Uh, he's got a bit of a track record. That's a good one as an OC, but as a head coach, he still had to learn like all first year head coaches do. But I mean, he had a short training camp, no preseason games. He couldn't hold meetings. You know, he had to use, he got hired late. So those things that coaches do in, in December and January, he didn't get to do until February and March. And that, so that puts him two months behind in preparing um, the, the, you know, he couldn't, he had to inherit the staff of the old coach because they couldn't make changes to the coaching staff because it was so late in the year. Uh, you know, their special teams coordinator leaves uh, a month before camp starts. They hire another guy. They have to fire him three weeks into the yeah. season. Uh, and it just, it just, just nothing went right for him. The COVID shut down. He couldn't have a meeting with his coaching staff in person until day one of training camp. Uh, the COVID protocols forced Zoom meetings, especially with so many players unvaccinated. So, yeah, it was just just everything went wrong for him. And 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 I think he's a better coach than than he showed this year. And I think he'll be a, a pretty good coach. I hope someone will give him another opportunity at some time because I believe he deserves it. Yeah, I don't think that he was the, the issue, right? Yeah, I think, and especially with the track record he's had and hopefully the connections he has with other people. Yeah. Like you were saying about um, people, I, I remember seeing even Twitter posts about people winning things, like, oh, I got $100 off from the, the store, the Edmonton store, and you know, not being able to redeem it or not, you know, not ever uh, having anyone get in touch that way. So I definitely know. Yeah, I mean... It, I, I get it. You you lay up all these people, but then you know you're trying, to- <laughs> and, and it just snowballs too, right? Yeah. And then they don't win a game on home field all season long, right? And and as uh, Alan Watt put it, who is now the uh, interim COO, a guy who's been around the franchise since 1980, uh, he said, you know, if you lose all your games at home, all of a sudden the hot dogs are cold and the beer is hot. And everybody gets upset about everything and every little thing bothers you even more. And it just, uh, it just steamrolled from there. Uh, you know, and they just couldn't, they just couldn't stop it. The fan, the fan uh, unrest by the entire fan base, I think was just too much for the board of directors to look at. I mean, if you have Twitter, you can see the fans are upset. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. And Twitter's all, please don't take your, yeah. all your positions from Twitter, right? Because that's certainly not right. But uh, if you have Twitter or any kind of social media, you could tell the fans yeah. are upset. Uh, I want to know what was it like that press conference when all this came down, like you said, to have all this come. Uh, and I know that I actually should go watch the, the whole video now about it. Cause I've read all the articles. What was that like kind of experiencing that? Uh, it was, uh, it was kind of surreal to think that, you know, I, I think we were all expecting changes and, and I, I think it, it was a little easier to take at the news conference because they put a release out a couple hours earlier that said they were, what they were going to announce, right. That basically said they had fired the, the three guys. So, uh, we knew it. And if it would have been announced, it would have been much more of a shock. That's for sure. No doubt about that. But they, uh, yeah, it was, it was surreal because it is sweeping changes. I mean, you've heard of sweeping changes, coaches and GMs have been fired, but president coach and GM, it just, it's, it's unheard of. And, and it's just, affects you know every aspect of the franchise i mean it's not like okay business is good we got to fix football or football's good we got to fix business they got to fix everything and they fired everybody and i think that that is what uh, caught everybody by surprise even the people who wanted these guys fired were probably surprised that all three of them were fired i think a lot of people would have been happy if it was just the gm or just the coach or just the president or whatever but for all three to be fired was a pretty bold move and i think uh, a lot of people were surprised by it uh, last question on this, and then I, I do want to touch on the the semifinals here. Uh, bringing in Wally Buono, right, to be kind of the interim GM, right? I mean, is that is that weird? Is that normal? I mean, talk to me through that. Well, I, I think the situation is because there's so much that has to get done this month. And and I I, I don't know. He's not really the interim GM. Uh, he's going to advise yeah. football ops and what they have to do. Uh, the Elks have an assistant GM, and I, I don't know his status moving forward. Of course, that'll be decided by the new general manager and everything. So I assume that, that he's Bobby Merritt's doing a little bit more right now and, and some of the other football staff. But what they need to do more is get a GM in place as quickly as possible because there's some things you can do before the calendar year ends that will help you on your salary cap next year. Like you can re-sign players. Now, if you have leftover money, the rule is if you have leftover money 
for the 2021 season on your salary cap, you can use that net to sign a player. Now give him a, you know, if you're going to pay him a hundred thousand dollars, you can give him a $30,000 bonus if you have it. And then you only have to pay him 70,000 next year. So only 70,000 to the cap instead of a hundred thousand. So there's a way to, to save money, but you got to have a GM in place to do that. So I think that's why they brought someone on board who can get through the list and, and say, okay, these five guys should be on your short list. Now, I've interviewed him. I think these are the five guys you should talk to. You talk to him and let's all make a decision. I think that's more than anything. And, and uh, free agency is coming in February. So there's an, an awful lot of scouting that has to be done and preparation that has to be done. Like 80% of the league is on one year contract. So free agency is just a mammoth undertaking right now. First, you got to figure out who you can re sign on your own team, who you want to re sign on your own team, and who you want to go after on other teams and, and wait and see if other teams sign those guys before you get a chance to, to make them a contract offer uh, on uh, in February. When free agency hit. So they need a GM in place, you know, as soon as possible. And that's why they're kind of doing it backwards. Usually it's, you know, you hire the president, he hires the GM and the GM hires the coach, but they're going to hire the GM first and the president, which is a, such an important hire, especially now for this franchise that has to do so much work with the fan base. They're going to take their time, make sure they get the right guy for that. And that's probably won't happen until mid January. Yeah, you just hope that, like you said earlier, you know, the the lateness with Coach Elizondo, you know, everything last year, you just hope that that doesn't repeat itself this year, right? And you go, well, now you got to give yourself a chance, right? Yeah, you got to yeah. give yourself a chance to be successful. And they, they kind of, you know, and, you know, they, they didn't do it on purpose. I mean, Scott Milanovic quit, right? Uh, he, yeah. he quit, uh, you know, in late January and, and a week later, they hired Elizondo. But I mean, there's work to be done when you hire a new coach, right? You got to lay the ground base. And I think that Milanovic knew he was probably leaving and he was, he was doing some interviews and trying to get another gig. And, and so a lot of that stuff might've fallen, you know, uh, under the radar with him. And then Elizondo has to come in and change the things that were set up and set it up the way he wants it. So there was so much to do and he just didn't have enough time. Uh, looking forward here, you know, weekend, uh, exciting games, you know, even if none of our, none of our teams are involved in it anymore, uh, which of the two matchups is exciting you the most, uh, in terms of the West showdown or the East? Uh, they're both pretty good. I think, uh, I, I mean, they're both, both. Uh, divisions have have good matchups. The teams are close. Uh, I I think I'm calling for an upset in the West. I think I think Calgary is there's peaking. I think they're you know they've got it together in the last half of the season. And Saskatchewan struggled a little bit, especially offensively. They haven't been able to put up a lot of points. I mean they struggled to beat the Elks in back to back games in in the last two games, uh, second and third last games of the season for them. So yeah, they uh, they've got some issues. And you know a lot of times you can wipe the slate clean and come out and play great in the playoffs. We'll see, but. Uh, I, I think that's going to be a pretty good matchup. You know, going into Saskatchewan, there's going to be a great atmosphere for the game for sure. Uh, but uh, I, I like the Stampeders' chances. Uh, they, you know, if if Bo Levi Mitchell can can play well, I mean, they're better at the, the top end of the quarterbacks. Is you know, Calgary wins that battle if they're both playing at their best. So uh, I think Calgary's got a pretty good chance for an upset. That'll be a good game in the East. I mean, that's two pretty even teams. They both, you know, uh, they finished virtually, you know, the, almost the same record. So uh, you know. Uh, Hamilton's probably got a bit of an advantage, um, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what Trevor Harris can do with Montreal. If he, you know, uh, looks like he's probably going to get the start. And uh, he had a great playoff game in 2019 in Montreal with Edmonton, where he, he just was outstanding. So if he can find that magic again, maybe Montreal's uh, got a better opportunity. But I think Hamilton is a better team all around. Both teams have good defenses, but uh, I think Hamilton has a better team all around, and they've got home field advantage. And I think that might be the difference. Yeah, I, 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 I still. I, sorry, I, I still, I don't know what Montreal is, right? I, I felt like early on and they've stumbled and with the Trevor Harris of it all, I just don't, it just seems like a big stretch that they're going to really make it the next three, you know, ticks here to get, I don't know. I just, that, that seems like a lot from bringing in a new quarterback kind of mid season like that. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. They're, they're probably of the six teams uh, in the playoffs, they would be probably the sixth team I'd pick to win the Grey Cup. But, you never know, right? It just takes it just takes Trevor Harris, a quarterback and a receiver, to all of a sudden get hot with each other, and uh, you know and they can win you win you football games. They they have a really good defense uh, that can win you games as well. So so we'll see. Uh, it's it's I think they're both going to be really good games on Sunday. Uh, I want to before we let you go. So a lot was made. You know, we had some weird matchups here, right? You know, Toronto earlier of the week. You know, was resting people in, in Winnipeg and all that. A lot was made about the Saskatchewan game. You know, maybe comments that the players were. And I'm going to talk with uh, Luke Melinders coming up here in a little bit about it too. You know, maybe the players weren't playing 
right? Like they really wanted to be there. They weren't playing the way, you know, here we had Edmonton, you know, voting and doing traveling, doing all this, playing all these games and all these, you know, days. Did you have any thoughts on that? And and kind of like the end of the season, these games don't matter as much for certain teams. Maybe we're not going to play all the way. Yeah, it was, it was weird because at, at the end of the day, nothing really mattered in the last week, right? Once when, you know, Edmonton was officially eliminated and, and I mean, uh, then, then Montreal loses to Ottawa, which nobody thought would happen. Uh, and yeah, it, it was, it was a weird week. It was a weird week. It was, it was, it was good for a lot of players who don't play because they got a chance to play and it was good for teams to rest guys. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always, you know, on the line with that. I don't know if, if, if resting a player, especially especially in football, is good. I think it was good for Winnipeg. They they rested Caleros for a week uh, the week before, and then played him a little bit in the final week, which is good. So you kind of try to keep him sharp, but still you know protect him a little bit. I I, I think it's pretty difficult. Because football is all about rhythm, right? It's all about rhythm and reps and, and doing it and doing it in day in and day out. And I think when you sit down a quarterback for a game at the end of the year, sometimes that can backfire for you. And um, we'll see. We'll see. You know, and, you know, in cold weather is going to play a factor. If, if it gets cold, I'm not sure what the temperature is going to be in Hamilton, but uh, the prairies are pretty frosty today. So I know it's going to be, uh, it'll probably be pretty chilly in, in Regina. Uh, on on Sunday, although it's supposed to warm up a little bit, I guess over the next couple of days we'll see. But uh, and and you know it's going to be a hero, right? Somebody's going to step up and do something that you don't expect, and it depends which team that guy's on. Yeah, I'm excited. I think it's going to be uh, an enticing weekend. I, I think both games around. I think you know there there's been criticisms this year. Some of the CFL games, you know, maybe it's not the most entertaining. This, you know, I get it. People are talking playoffs. We're going strong. Uh, who you know, just if you had to put uh, before we let you go, your uh, call your shot. Who who are we seeing in, in, in the Grey Cup? Uh, it's pretty easy to pick Winnipeg, uh, but I think Calgary's got a chance to upset them. I, I really like the Stampeders' makeup, uh, their experience. They got enough guys that have been around long enough to to know to have the experience to playing in those big games. So I think they have an opportunity uh, to upset Winnipeg. And I mean, all the pressure's on Winnipeg, right? There's no like like the the Stampeders are in the position the Bombers were in in 2019. Uh, going on the road for the playoffs, no one expects them to win. They they got in a roll. They played really well. Uh, and we talked earlier about bringing a quarterback in late in the season. They did that, and it worked out very well for him with Kilaro. So, um, yeah, it's but pressure's on Winnipeg. So we'll see how they handle it. So to me, it's I, I probably say Winnipeg, but I think Calgary's got a chance. And in, in the East, I think Toronto. I think Toronto will uh, will win the East. Uh, they're just I think they're just uh, so much above. The other teams, and, and if McLeod Bethel Thompson has a good game for sure, and their defense has improved so much with Chris Jones since he's arrived, so I, I, I'll take Toronto in the East and Winnipeg slash Calgary in the West. If, <laughs> if I had to put my house on it, I'd put I'd, I'd say Winnipeg just because. Uh, but uh, I, I, I got a I got a soft spot for Calgary this year in the playoffs. I think the games are all going to be terrific. Though it hasn't you're right, it hasn't been a very entertaining season this year. It hasn't been a lot of fun to watch the games because they just have not been what they've been in years past. But they got a chance for a pretty big finish here with the last uh, with the playoff games, the last you know two games in each division, and then the Grey Cup. So hopefully, hopefully they'll finish up strong. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're going to be in Hamilton. So I just, I hope it's not, you know, 40 to zero or something. I just, I hope, you know, Winnipeg, if they're there, I hope there's some, some semblance of a, you know, a competition match. Cause I am scared that it's going to be like cold in the snow. We're going to be sitting there. Winnipeg's going to be up like five scores. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, where are you from? You're Seattle. <laughs> Seattle. So that's not bad. You're, you're used to the damp air, right? Uh, Hamilton, Hamilton, it can get cold, but it also, I mean, we were, we were in Ontario, uh, you know, a week ago and it was plus three Celsius. So I was saying, you know, there's still, there were still orange and red leaves on the tree. So it was still, it was still pretty nice. Uh, meantime, it's minus 10 back in Edmonton. So uh, yeah. it, it can be, it can be pretty nice. It can be, it can be workable uh, in Hamilton. So I think you'll have a good time and you're going to meet a lot of great people. Uh, CFL week. I don't know how, restrictive it's going to be this year but the cfl week is uh just a fantastic week for cfl fans you have to do something though i'm going to tell you right now you have to get to the spirit of edmonton room yep. uh make sure and go there early because you might have such a great time you'll just stay there just for stay. every night it, it is it is the best spot to go uh come great cup week so make sure you get there early Okay. Well, uh, Morley, thank you so much for coming on. This has been fun. Yeah, it worked out. We were going to just kind of vamp about the season. Lots of news this week. I appreciate it. And your safe travels and taking the time to come on. Yeah, anytime. Glad to do it. I was ha- uh, happy to be here and uh, happy Thanksgiving.
Uh, happy, I, uh, happy American Thanksgiving. I already posted our episode preview online and I got a lot of Canadians saying it's not. I go, I know that's why I said it's American Thanksgiving. So it's just football day for us on Thursday. That's all. Well, and this, and we thank you for that. <laughs> well, and it, it resembles uh, not the most appealing of football matchups this year either for the whole slate. Yeah. Sadly, that one thing, the bad thing about American Thanksgiving is you got to watch the Lions play, right? I will. I as a recent convert to the NFL as well. I'll never understand that, but yes, that that, that is one of our legacies. Is yeah, watching gotcha. the Lions suffer. Uh, so thank you so much. My pleasure. Welcome back. Welcome back. Hopefully, you enjoyed those uh, little chats about what's going on at Edmonton, all the craziness there. We're going to talk about that here in a second. But of course, it was the final week of the regular season in CFL. Uh, Edmonton beat Toronto 13 to 7 uh, because basically Toronto probably just like, we already won, you yep. know, versus Sweden. So there's no reason to play our players. Ottawa beats Montreal 19 to 18. That Edmonton was surprising. Also- that was surprising. Montreal, you know, Montreal was playing for the home, the home birth of the, of the, you know, Hobstein home. Uh, that was scary. And now they need to go to Hamilton uh, for the Eastern semifinal because Hamilton uh, beats uh, Saskatchewan 24 to three Calgary over Winnipeg 13 to 12, because probably because Winnipeg didn't play other players. And then uh, BC uh, beats uh, Edmonton in their second game that week, 43 to 10. Yeah, that was all the reschedules with member. They had the outbreaks and all that. But that was great because that's like BC's last thing, right? Like last game of the year. It, I mean, they, they just absolutely just smoked the living ass out of them. I mean, it really was like a remarkable game to see. I know that Edmonton was on the road a long time. So that wasn't, they weren't playing at full strength. But yeah. All right. We're, we're going to come back to this story because the big story I think this week that we need to focus on is, is the Elks firing basically everybody. Okay, and we saw, and we kind of felt it was coming because it was just like every week there was something bad. We were talking about Edmonton every week. We're bringing something bad up, like the guy didn't want to get vaccinated. This, you know, Elizondo's letting go of players that they probably could have used during the course of the season because they didn't fit a, a club culture. Well, the club culture they wanted is gone. It's gone. Everybody's out. It's good. I, I mean, it's not good. And I talked with Morley about this. I mean, obviously we don't want anyone to lose their jobs, but yeah. you had season ticket holders basically rioting and saying like, we will not re up for next season. If these people are still in charge. Yep. Thanks. So, I mean, w- when you're, w- when you fan driven league and you got 22,000 ticket holders, season ticket holders, and only like 8,000 are going to the games. That's scary. Yeah. Those are people that right. like, yeah, you already paid. You already paid for your season tickets, and you're not going because you're so disappointed in the product on the field. But that's the culture Jamie Elizondo wanted, and now the, the culture that he wanted is no longer there because he's no longer there. Uh, Wally Bono is uh, agreeing to consult and advise in hiring a new general manager, with the ex- ex- decision expected to be named before the end of this year. So, you know, a little over a month. Well, I, I did see a tweet online that said. You know, the CFL, we're trying to build like young, we're trying to get new coach, co- coaches and new staff, you know, all these new ideas, all this stuff, like maybe a 71 year old interim GM that, you know, coached, you know, not a million years ago, but you know, a long time ago, like maybe we should have brought in some more youthful uh, people, but it sounds like he had done this before, right? He had been, um, he had been part of the Alouettes, he consulted with them, but he is the winningest coach. I mean, I get all this, but he, I would have brought in potentially some other younger ideas to, to, to find. Right. I think, I think all he's going to do is just going to find a new GM and that's that he's not going to be in any power play here. It's just a temporary thing. No, but like if you're trying to find a young voice, would you hire a 71 year old man to do that? I don't know. I, who knows? Who knows that guy's tapped into. So, uh, tie cats owner, Bob Young calls this season, the very best in league history. The CFL was criticized for its state of on-field product during the 2021 season, but the Hamilton Tiger Cats owner, Bob Young, isn't having it. He says, you have it backwards. 2021 is easily the very best season in the long history of the CFL. Uh, They've survived not only a two-year global pandemic, it has come out the other side stronger. Hmm. So this is an interesting story. We're working on this. This is developing news. Uh, Because I had reached out to the Tiger Cats weeks ago and said, hey, you know, we're coming up to Hamilton. We'd love to have Bob Young on the show. What kind of hoops do we need to jump through? Could we talk to someone? Never responded, never responded, never responded. So then when Bob Young came out about this, I tweeted, you know, Mr. Young from our verified account and said, um, 
our podcast would have been a great place for you to kind of share these views. And uh, we're talking. So he's going to let me know. I sent him some links to some episodes. He's checking them out. I mean, obviously, we're on holiday break right now, but he's going to let me know if he's interested in coming on next week. I would love to have Mr. Young come on. Uh, happy to share the voices and opinions, uh, especially of team owners uh, in the league. Very cool stuff. CFLPA desiring more continuity and player contracts under the new CBA. Uh, it's expe- it's ex- set to expire in May 2022, um, which, you know, that's 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 a big thing. If contracts, collective bargaining agreements expire, there's either a strike or there's a walk lockout. And if, you know, if Bob Young says 2021 is one of the best in, in league history, then you don't want to follow it up with something like this that's going to potentially cause a work stoppage. Yeah, so they're working, the, the idea here, you know, they, they're trying to get longer contracts, right? We've talked about this before, both with coaching staffs, but especially with the players, right? Building some continuity year over year, right? All these players, basically back in 2014, uh, they were permitted to sign one year uh, contracts that veteran players were, and that kind of because there's always issues with like players um, wanting to go back to the NFL, and there used to be a rule that you had to be here so long, and and now. Basically, it's like everyone's on one-year deals. It used to kind of be the exception, and now it's the norm. And so they're, you know, they're really trying to build these. You know, Winnipeg is successful because they carried over most of their players from last year. A lot of these other teams, like Edmonton, Riot, Argos are the exception. They brought in a lot of free agency, but you know, trying to build that continuity year over year. But yeah, the the CFLPA is really pushing for that with the new collective bargaining. Very cool stuff. Uh, hopefully they get hopefully they get taken care of a little bit more in the player's side, like financially. I would love to see them make more money, but that's just me. Arizona Cardinals have released quarterback Chris Strevler, according to Gambo, over at 98.7 Arizona Sports. The news came after Cardinals claimed quarterback Trace McSorley off the Baltimore Ravens practice ros- roster. Uh, he spent two seasons with the, with the Cardinals, 17-25, to 25, 141, one touchdown, one interception. Uh, he made... Uh, a little bit over six hundred thousand his first NFL season. It was slated to collect almost eight hundred thousand this year. That's a lot more than the CFL. <laughs> That's a lot more than the CFL. The Gal- Dallas Cowboys, Cowboys have released Canadian place kicker Lirib Harajuluru. Uh, Hadralu. Hadralu. Um, the five foot eleven, two hundred five pounder dressed for one game while Zerline was out during due to uh, COVID nineteen protocols. He didn't feel any jitters. He went perfect on his converts and kickoffs in a route of the Atlanta Falcons. The Atlanta Falcons, and of course, they did not do good against the Cowboys. Streveler was weird. A lot of Arizona fans seemed really happy that he was let go. I'm like, he was your third string backup quarterback. Kyler Murray is hurt all the time. Like, I can't imagine that Streveler was like, Kyler you're Murray's nine and two. Six. You're five foot six, Kyler Murray. Um, the Canadian Football League has unveiled East and West Division All Stars for 2021 season. The Blue Bombers, of course, leading all teams with 15 All Star selections. Uh, Hamilton, even though they have to, you know, they're not number one seed in the East, they left uh, the East Division All Stars with 10. A total of 14 national players were selected. Um, yeah. Yeah. Our, I just put the list here. So you can tip yeah, our boy, McLeod Bethel Thompson. The homie from Tucson, fellow homie from Tucson, Kadeem Carey, on the list. Shout outs to him. Uh, a lot of good players here. Uh, I would love to see these two teams play like in a pro. <laughs> that, might, that might be interesting. That yeah. would be actually really good. Zach Clara is there. Kenny Lawler is here. Lucky by head. It, this is good. I mean, this is, it, it, you know, we've, there's been criticisms of the value this year, some of the games and stuff. This is a stacked list of talent. When you look at these, see, I would agree. Like, we should do an all star battle of that. Definitely. TV ratings for the final weekend of the CFL had very little drama attached. Um, apparently, the Elks and Toronto Argonauts averaged 167,000. Wow. Ottawa, uh, Montreal, 325,000. Um, the uh, the second Edmonton match of the week against BC Lions, three hundred forty-eight thousand. Uh, Hamilton and Saskatchewan, four hundred eight thousand, and uh, Calgary and Winnipeg, four hundred nine thousand. So. It's tough, right? There's not a lot of drama there. This weekend, they're playing Sunday games, both of the semifinals. You know, the next three weekends, they're all, you know, including the Grey Cup. Uh, and Mike was, th- this was put together by Mike Mitchell. Yeah, you know, but just talking like, I think they're going to get smoked in ratings, right? Against NFL this weekend, even with the semis. A uh, friend of the show, Josh, was messaging me this morning. There's still tickets available for both of the semifinal games, both in Hamilton and in, um, uh, it's in Calgary, right? It's in. Sorry. No, it's in Saskatchewan. Sorry, it's at Mosaic. Uh, there's still uh, tickets available for like all these games, but I do think they're going to get smoked with the ratings, and that's not good. Completely agree. Moving on to the XFL news, Heineke and PJ Walker. I just want to talk a little bit about this. Do you have any thoughts? I, I mean, you know, people. I saw people on Twitter saying Heineke's not the answer. Still, it's like, well, then what is? What is the answer for this year? Tell me what the answer is for this year in no. Washington. 
I have my, oh, I forgot to mention in, in the Davis Sanchez interview, we're sitting there mid interview. He's like, is that a Taylor Heineke jersey? I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, like, what's your connection? I'm like, well, he's XFL and all that. David yeah. Sanchez, big Taylor Heineke mark. Well, you know, why wouldn't you be? Uh, this made me mad that Cam Newton in his loss got more highlight film on every single NFL show I saw than Taylor Heineke did in his win. Yeah. I mean, isn't that so frustrating? <laughs> I mean, it is, but like at the same time, it's like this story about Cam. He got drafted by the Panthers, got let go. You know, they didn't feel like he was the right fit, got let go, went to New England where they thought like he was going to be, you know, he was going to turn around that franchise, like not even turn around that franchise, but keep that franchise afloat from all its Super Bowl appearances and stuff like that. Didn't work out, got released, didn't see him going anywhere, but then back to the Panthers. It, it's It's a good story, but there is a lot of disrespect, not just being heaped on Heineke, but PJ Walker in this case. Well, it's like, crazy. PJ Walker started the game in which Cam's like ripping off his jersey, yelling, I'm back to the camera. Like, but you're back, but you didn't start, Cam. If you were really back, Cam, you would have started that game. But they didn't feel comfortable you starting that game after you'd been out. And PJ Walker led them to that win. And there's I just think there's been more disrespect on PJ Walker in terms of Cam Newton than, than Taylor Heineke. Well, you even sent me the clip where Coach Rule was asked, like, did you think about bringing in P.J. Walker at the end of that game? This, you know, the second game where they lost. And he said, well, no, you know, Cam had gotten this that far, whatever. I'm like, okay, I mean. But P.J. got you that far last week, and you took him out for Cam. Like, what's... I don't, don't like you play the players? Don't you play the players that give you the best chance to win? Isn't that the rule? Isn't that the, what, you shouldn't be, like, beholden and say, Cam's got to be in there no matter what. No, I don't like that. I don't like, and I just, like I said, just someone winning, you know, Cam came out, did the whole touchdown and then ran to the 50 yards. And it's like, and then you lost, like normally you would make fun of that, right? You'd be like in wrestling when they, when they flex, when you lose like that. No, in wrestling, when the good guy like waves to the crowd and then he gets rolled up and then gets pinned, you're like, oh, look at that dumb guy that did that. Like, what is the difference where Cam goes out, does this big celebration and then lost, he lost. You don't flex when you lose. You just don't do that. Uh, Heineke, we, we've talked about this online. Heineke might be Russell Wilson this week. I'm very, very nervous for Monday Night Football. I, I'm not doubting that he might. Uh, the Seattle looks bad. Seattle looks really bad. And I mean, I'm not just not just bad, like in terms of like their personnel. I'm talking about like their future is bad. It's really scary. They gave up their draft picks for Jamal Adams, who hasn't done dick. I mean, Vince Wolfork has the same amount of interception. Big old Vince Wolfork has the same amount of interceptions as Jamal Adams has for his career. Figure that out for me, that you got a safety that's supposed to be making interceptions, has the same amount of interceptions that Vince Wolfork has, who was a defensive lineman. That's just wild to me that Seattle gave up so much for this player that is clearly past his prime and never was, you know, worth that amount of hype, I guess. I don't know. Uh, just a couple class things. Oakland A's, right? Moving to Vegas potentially. They're talking to Ben about Oakland market. You know, we, we've maybe moved the Wildcats there. Should uh, the USFL think about Oakland? But I mean, that's the one billion. I mean, this is going to be big time if the Oakland moves to Vegas. I, I think Oakland is moving. I'm not sure if it's to Vegas, but I do think th the athletics are going to move. Uh, then they obviously settled the NFL thing, right? Did you track any of that? $790 million against Kroenke? Uh I did not track that, but I, it's it's interesting that like, that settlement basically absolves all of the other teams from playing, paying that legal fee. That's all on Kroenke to pay that 790 million and it, and it should be, and it should be because uh, he said if he was able to do this, he would pay for the legal cost and he should look, pay that $790 million. God, that's a lot of money. I mean, he's worth billions, right? But that's, yeah. that's a crap ton of money. Uh, and then this is interesting. Golden Sachs is brought in to negotiate the NFL media deals. A mm -hmm. uh, Amazon is in talks about acquiring 49% of the NFL. I, network. I am not surprised about this at all. And I'll tell you why. It's like, this is the next step for these over-the-top streaming services to get live sports. You watch, wait and see. When the WWE comes up for their their renegotiation for their rights fees, whether in year two of their contracts right now with Fox and NBC, you're going to see Amazon. You're going to see Apple TV. You're going to see these streaming services go after this content. You're going to see them pay big money for this content that might not be worth the money that they're paying for just to outbid NBC from getting it, just to bid, outbid Amazon from getting it. These over-the-top streaming services are going to get into, going to get into live sports. And, and, and if they've got the money, they're going to, they're going to take it off of your regular over-the-air. You're not going to be able to watch 
you know, Thursday night football on NBC. You're going to have to watch Apple TV. You're going to pay nine 99 a month to watch Apple TV if they get the rights to the NFL. So these over the top streaming services are definitely, uh, it's going to be interesting to see if they make, a, if they make a dent in terms of like making bits. I just hate that we all like jump ship and we're going to like cut the cable and now all the cable companies all have their own streaming services. And then we all subscribe to them now, and which eventually like it's going to drive our prices up higher than it was when we had the cable. That's the funny thing is like, I saw someone was like, wait a second, we're all cutting the cable. These companies that, that distribute content are gonna be like, well, we need to go over the top and we need to get on Apple TV and Roku. And then we have to pay, you know, we have to pay subscription fee for our content now because we're not getting it from the cable companies. So you end up paying more in the long run. It's, it's interesting to say the least. Uh, a couple quick voicemails before we go, Jenna. I got her Thanksgiving and Richard. We'll play these. Get out of here. Speakpipe.com slash Marcus if you want to leave us a voicemail. Jenna, I'm really glad to hear from Jenna. It took her a couple weeks to get a call in, but here's Jenna. Hey, y'all. It's Jenna. Bree, Paul, happy Thanksgiving. Mwah. Fun week with the USFL news. Uh, I don't know if by now you both picked your teams, but the Pittsburgh Maulers are going to drop the hammer on everyone. <laughs> wow, still a while to the XFL. I'm perfectly okay with there just being the eight teams. I guess my question would be, if there were expansions, would you both prefer 2.0 style names, or would you prefer some of the 1.0 names to make a comeback? Uh, personally, I wouldn't mind seeing some of the 1.0 names. That would be cool. Well, anyway, everyone take care. Enjoy your day. Love you all. Bye. Very nice, Jenna. Jenna. Thank you. Jenna. Would you? Uh, like- yeah, 1.0 teams definitely. You know, Den- we're talking about Denver Gold, LA Express. Yeah. Well, I think uh, she means XFL stuff. Like, do you want to see like the Demons come oh. or like uh, like the Hitmen? They were very <laughs> offensive names. <laughs> the XFL 1.0 names are very offensive. That might be that might be fun to see the hitmen come back to see you know what was the uh, Las the Vegas maniacs. outlaws yeah the, the outlaws the maniacs yeah that'd be good I like I would like to see that happen like bring back you know Las Vegas definitely would would kill I think XFL would kill Las Vegas right now that's just that's my opinion but I would love to see these uh, these 1.0 XFL teams come back that'd be cool. Hey, Jenna, cool. Thank you for wishing us a happy American Thanksgiving. I appreciate that. Hey, this last one, Richard, it's really short. Richard, I didn't preface, I didn't pre look at this. So if you drop an F bomb or something, I'm never playing your voicemails again. And hey, Mark, this is Richard. I got one question to ask you. When are the U.S. is uh, going to hire new coaches? And uh, when are they going to start looking at players? Because they only got like five months left for the so called season supposed to start. So the question of the other day, when do you think they will hire people or when are they going to get things together? I think Richard left that like from the Thanksgiving table. Like, I think he was literally sitting at the table, like, "Oh, I got to leave a voicemail for the Mark Huss. Um, when do I think they're going to start hiring coaches for 2023? No, 2022 USFL. Oh, good question. I get DMs all the time right now asking like when tryouts are. I don't know. It's- we don't know. Do we know? There's not going to be that long of a runway. April 15th kickoff, March, early March training camps. You know, I would say late January. I mean, I would say right, maybe right after the Super Bowl, USFL does that. I mean, February, March, yeah, it's got to be in January. It's got to be in the NFL season because there's no way you announce that at the end of uh, February. I think, what you do, I think what you do is you wait till the week in between the AFC and NFC title games before the Super Bowl. You do it that week. You roll out all your stuff that week. Everybody's already football crazy. Nothing is going on football wise. You roll everything you're doing out that flipping week. So you are taking all of that attention that is going, you know, that normally would go to the Super Bowl. You're taking that attention going, wait, there's another football league here. Let's pay attention to this for a week or wait for the Super Bowl. There you go. That's the way you solve that problem. The issue you're going to have in speaking of the XFL, USFL Civil War is all the, because they're also going to be doing their year long. Roll out. So you're going to have all the XFL like, hey, guess what we have coming up competing with the USFL going right now. It's going to be interesting because you're going to have like the year from now announcements and then the we're starting next month announcements. So hmm. good questions there on the line. Again, you can leave us a voicemail line. Reed's got the address right here. Was it speakpipe.com slash 
Markcast. Leave us a voicemail. If you have a question for our guest coming up, feel free to leave it there too. It's a great way to talk to these guests that, that Reed is working very hardly, uh, working very hard to get on the podcast and it's your way to speak to them. So yeah, definitely, man, just leave a question um, for any of our guests. And I'm sure Reed will get around to uh, playing that for the guests uh, and you can follow all of our stuff on social media. Reed announces it's going to be on the show. So it's, it's very timely to get your questions questions in not only for us, but for our guests. Yeah. A guy get an email the second it goes in. So to let me know. Cool stuff. Again, uh, review us over on the markcast.com slash review Buy some merch. We appreciate your time. We appreciate you listening. So like, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, our Facebook pages, all of our social media, just like, and subscribe and keep following us, interact with us. And uh, we appreciate all of our, all of our viewers slash listeners. Thanks. And with that being said, we'll see you next week. Hopefully you guys had a happy Turkey day and uh, we will talk to you. Uh, we're leading up to the uh, playoffs here. We'll talk to you next week about that. See ya. 